Old Friends from Kling K. Back when I was five years old in 1996, my parents and I lived in a camper near the lake in Lake Worth, Texas, while our house was being built elsewhere. It was a nice location in an RV park, with the lake being less than 100 meters away and plenty of kind neighbors and other kids to play with. I often played outside by myself while everyone else was busy and once was almost crushed by a random falling tree branch. I had heard the crack and looked up to see it falling straight down at me and only just managed to scream and run out of the way in time, hearing a thud right after. There was a puff of fine Texas sand surrounding the branch that was at least as big as I was at the time, but that's beside the point. You see, I have these memories. They're very vivid, very detailed, though some are missing. These are memories I know aren't a dream, but they're too bizarre to be believable or real. I fully believe that I may have been abducted at one point in my life. I remember sitting in a room that was dimly lit, but there was still enough light to be able to make things out. Somehow I'd gotten changed in what can be compared to as a hospital gown, and fittingly I was lying in a hospital bed, or something akin to it. The room was large enough to accommodate at least eight other beds besides my own, but it was bare save for a few small metal tables of strange tools nearby and a single large closed door in the middle of the wall I was facing. The whole room as well as the floor and door seemed to be made of some sort of shiny dark blue metal, the kind of blue you'd expect to see right before the sun disappears behind the horizon. The door appeared to open in the middle and had what seemed to be darker blue lines etched into it. I assumed it was decorative I was not in this room alone, however. There were about four to five beings in front of me, all of average human height, maybe 5'6 to 5'10. But they weren't human. They had smoky gray skin and your typical gray alien-shaped heads and eyes, only not nearly as exaggerated, with lipless mouths and no nose at all. Each hand had five digits, with the fingers being only slightly elongated compared to a human's. They didn't wear any clothes and had no features to indicate gender. I could still somehow mentally discern male and female. There were at least three males present. Two stood around taking notes on what appeared to be stiff paper with no sort of clipboard to support it, while two of the females ignored me as they fiddled around with various tools that were on the tables nearby. Somehow, I knew in my mind that these were aliens, only I didn't feel threatened or scared. It was like what we were doing was normal. It was routine. The fifth alien, a male, was kneeling and holding one of my legs, moving it as if to test the joints and tendons, making sure they were working okay. He repeated this with my other leg and both of my arms, his hands didn't feel much different from a human's, warm and soft, although the fingertips did feel a bit strange, like a flattened out suction cup or something. The air of familiarity surrounding this one alien was akin to that of a parent, maybe even more so, as I've never really felt comfortable around anyone my whole life. The way he touched me seemed to be delicate and caring, as if he were afraid of hurting or scaring me. I watched as he tested each of my joints, occasionally looking around at the other aliens, who didn't seem interested in me at all beyond observational information. Then I'm suddenly standing on one of the docks overlooking the lake. Moonlight is reflecting off the surface of it, shining the same blue as the metal of that room. The same alien from before was standing in front of me, handing me a sandwich that looked like lettuce between two pieces of white bread. I took a bite. It tasted like bottled water, not bread or lettuce at all. I tried handing it back to him, saying I don't like it, 
but he gently pushed it back at me with one of his hands, insisting, I think telepathically, that I needed to eat it. Things after this point are blank, and I suddenly woke up on the sofa of my parents' camper the next morning. I think maybe the sandwich thing was some sort of food that was meant to make me lose my memory. But as I ate only a single bite, I was able to retain much more than I was supposed to. 15 years later after this, I'm living in the middle of cow pastures, cornfields, and soybean crops in Haywarden, Iowa. Basically, the middle of nowhere. My boyfriend at the time was spending time with his brother, who was crashing on our sofa watching TV in the living room. I had opted to go to bed early, so as to not have to bear the obnoxious flatulence and boredom that always came with these two when we hung out. At some point, I'd finally fallen asleep, but I was awakened when my boyfriend came to bed. I exited the bedroom, which opened into the living room, and saw his brother sleeping on the sofa with the TV on. It was then that I, for some inexplicable reason, left the house through the kitchen, out the front door, and walked alone in the dark into one of the recently cultivated cornfields. It was merely rough stalk sticking about two inches out of the ground at that point, when a light began to shine on me from above. I shielded my eyes, searching for the source. It was coming from a rather modest-sized aircraft, flat on the bottom except for domes that were emitting the light. The whole craft seemed to be only about 15 feet in diameter, with a hole in the center that opened up into a red-lit room. I smiled, though. I didn't feel panic, as I knew my old friends had come to visit again. Possible Alien Abduction from Sodomir For some background, this happened a few years ago. I was maybe 16 or 17 living in my previous home. I have severe asthma, and my mother is an insomniac, so on days when my asthma is bad, she would check on me in my sleep to make sure that I didn't stop breathing out of nowhere. One day in particular, my asthma was acting up, and as per usual, very late into the night, she came to check on me. The only problem was, I was not in my bed. Panicked, she looked around the entire house. All the doors and windows were locked and shut still, but I wasn't in any of the rooms in the house, not hiding or passed out in a closet or anywhere. Half an hour or so later, she came back to my bedroom, but somehow, I was in there, sleeping, like I had never left. When I woke up the next day, my mom asked me where I went the previous night. I had no idea what she was talking about and expressed this to her. She had grown concerned visibly and explained the whole thing to me. The funniest thing is that I could recall dreams of bright white lights with black shadows moving in front of them, almost as if I had been on an operating table. I also had sudden, inexplicable bruises and marks on my body, but I could not recall how I got them, but they certainly weren't there the day before. Now, the area that I live in has a very strong military presence, and UFO sightings are quite common. I've even personally seen multiple in the six or so years that I'd been living there. One instance in particular, I was going to play Magic the Gathering at my local shop, when all of a sudden, my family and I spotted an orange circle in the sky. My mom thought it was the moon at first, but my brother and I noticed that it was moving across the sky. Once we pulled over, she had noticed this too, and the way it was moving was quite odd and erratic. This happened across the street from where I worked, so I was telling one of my night shift managers about it. Funnily enough, he experienced the same thing about 20 years earlier in the same exact spot. I don't know what it is with military bases and UFOs, but I theorize either the aliens are keeping an eye on us, or the government has technology 
far greater than we understand. I think an alien or UFO followed me home. From Anonymous. I'm open to any comments and theories as to what this may have been. It was around the early 2000s. I was eight years old. We lived in a rural setting, so when it's nighttime, I usually heard the farm animals my family owns making noises or rustling around in the cornfield a few feet away from my window. I was going to have a sleepover with my friend C tomorrow at his house. I should also probably mention that on the opposite side of the cornfield to the right side of my house was a forest that housed a creek. I was out playing at that creek all day, and when the sun was beginning to set, I decided to leave. Just then, I heard an animal growl, but it didn't sound right. It was more out of this world, literally. When I turned to look, I saw something with pitch black eyes and scaly skin looking at me from eight feet away from where I was positioned in the creek. I decided to make a beeline to the tree line, which was six feet away, and then to the house, which was only a few feet from the tree line. When I made it back, I did not tell my parents for fear of them telling me I'd made it up. My parents were especially quick to dismiss my claims as my imagination. Later that night, I woke up around 12.30, 12.24 to be precise, and I didn't know why. Not until I heard the animals making noises. Then they all stopped making any sound all at once. I stayed still for what felt like hours until I saw one of the cows named Brett get sucked up into a beam of light from the cornfield and what looked like a dark circular object floating up above before it all disappeared after a quick flash. The next morning, I learned that this was not a bizarre dream because Brett was still missing. The local sheriff had been called too. We weren't the only ones hit as throughout the countryside, there were dozens of missing animal reports which were particularly of cows. No one thought anything of it. Like in my family's case, the fence was broken, which had us assuming that it was either wolves or coyotes, or maybe they escaped or were taken by rustlers. Later that day, my friend C and I agreed to meet up halfway at a walking trail that led to his house, then walked to his house from there for the sleepover. I had everything ready for the sleepover and went on my way. A couple of minutes later, I heard something that sounded like a jet plane landing 4,000 feet away from where I was. It was weird, but I ignored it. But not too long after, that same animalistic, otherworldly growl came from the sideline of the trail we were walking on. It began to follow us as we jogged, then ran away from it. When we looked behind us, I definitely saw something. Something standing six feet tall on two legs with a predatory glare. C peered behind his shoulder and screamed at me to run, even though we already were. We sprinted to his house without skipping a beat. When we made it, we heard banging and screeching all around the house. That's when C called the sheriff and told him in a panicked voice that we were being attacked. He thinks that it was going to smash a window soon and I told him to hurry from the background. He turned to me and told me that the sheriff was on his way, and when he arrived, he saw claw marks all over the place. Besides that, the animal was gone with no other trace. The sheriff notified both sets of our parents. Mine came to get me to take me home. The sheriff also said not to use the trails anymore because they might not be safe, and if we had to be outside, we needed to carry some sort of weapon. On the way home, I had my window rolled down, and I swear to God, I heard a metallic sound ringing throughout the sky. I even saw some sort of circular metallic object fly above us. Later that night, C and I were texting, talking about that incident, and how strange and terrifying it had been. Later in the night, I heard that same metallic sound from earlier, this time, it was coming from around the cornfield. 
It was then that I decided to look out the window to see what was making noise. I saw yet another circular craft around the cornfield. There were beams and flashes of light again. Yet despite how bizarre the thing I was looking at was, I found myself in a daze, walking back to my bed and just lulling myself to sleep. Next thing I knew, it was morning, and everything was quiet beyond my comfort zone. Even more of our animals were missing that day. My parents were obviously upset. The sheriff was on our property, investigating this new incident. But there was a new development. Because within the footprints of the cows and other farm animals, there was a new footprint that was inhuman, but unlike any animal the sheriff had ever seen. That's the way he put it. Thankfully, not long after this, these experiences and events stopped all at once. The time after, my parents were able to slowly replace the animals at a great cost. And I hope these things don't happen again. They're dangerous, they're expensive, and they disrupt normal life on the farm. Not to mention, they completely boggle your mind. The Red Ball of Light in the Sky from Jack I live in Staten Island, New York. This took place a few months ago. I went to my cousin's party with my family. I'm not much of a social person, so I was mostly outside. This party took place in a building next to some woods and in front of a graveyard. I was looking out at the graveyard to try to find some ghosts. I was really just passing the time, when something bright caught my eye. I looked up overhead to see a red ball of light in the sky. It was leaving a trail as it continued to go up. I thought it was a balloon of some sort, until it stopped and went abruptly right. And just like that, it took off, flying away at incredible speed, still leaving a bizarre trail of light behind it. I actually would have believed that I'd imagined the whole thing, if it wasn't for a little girl pointing up to the sky, asking if I'd seen it too. I nodded as I went back into the building. I'm 100% sure that it was a UFO. I only had one other UFO encounter after that. I was sleeping silently one night when something woke me up. A whisper told me to listen. I went silent as I started to listen to a noise that sounded like something above me. It was so loud I decided to look up outside through my window to see a white light that was so bright that I couldn't see anything else. Five seconds later, I heard the same sound I'd heard that night, the sound of the object flying away. I'm not sure if it was alien in origin or something else, but it certainly was bizarre. I mistook an alien for my brother, from Isaac K. I'm a 20-year-old guy, but 10 years ago, something happened to me. It was a weekend night basically like any other. My dad had gone out to play poker, and my older brother was watching me at home. Before he took off, my dad said we needed to take out the trash. He wanted it done before he got back. So a little while after dad left, my brother and I decided to do it together. Now it's important to note that my older brother loved scaring me every chance he got, particularly using aliens and their mythos. So we got the trash from the bins and walked outside to the bigger trash bins. My brother threw away his trash bag with ease and disappeared into the darkness toward the back of the house. I thought it was weird he went that way. I assumed he was going to try to scare me like he often did, so I rolled my eyes and sighed as I struggled to get the trash in the bin. I'm a pretty darn short dude, and was even way smaller then. After getting the bag into the trash bin, I walked up our porch to go through the front door, and thinking my brother was still hiding out there in the dark to scare me, I walked to the end of the porch. That's when I saw it. A short and bulbous-headed creature stood a few feet ahead of me in the middle of our street, beneath the streetlight. So, because of the lighting, 
I couldn't make out too many details other than the shape. At first, I thought it probably was my brother trying to scare me. I called out his name. Let's call him Geo. Geo! I called out, but the figure did not move a muscle and remained completely silent. I called out a few more times, louder. Geo, come on, man. Stop trying to scare me. Come back inside. Again, the creature did not respond, and it dawned on me. This thing was not my brother. I ran to the front door as fast as my short legs could stride, tears streaming down my face in panic as I locked the door and then heard something. The shower was running. I ran and pounded on the door and screamed for my brother until he decided, obviously quite annoyed, to let me into the bathroom. He must have been in the house since he walked off earlier, hopping in the shower a while ago. When I got in, he was soaking wet in a towel and the whole bathroom was fogged up. My brother finished his shower while I sat on the tile floor of the bathroom. I was too scared to leave his side. When he got dressed, he had me take him outside and by then, whatever the thing was had vanished. Later on, the only thing I could figure the animal was, was some sort of alien. It had a short humanoid body and a large rounded head. To this day though, my brother doesn't believe me. My Alien Story from All Zeros. Every time I retell this story or even think about it, the hair on my arms rises. I was a young man, about 20 years old. There was a whole week where I had nightmares. One of the most relevant dreams I had involved being in this place that looked like it was underwater, like a marine-style bunker. Even though I was swimming, I could breathe somehow, and I could vividly feel everything, like the water moving between my fingers. I saw a man swimming in front of me, he was dressed in a jean jacket with long black hair, but he hadn't noticed me. I followed him, and he crawled up to something that looked to be a sewer opening. When he opened it, I saw four long tan arms pull him out. I decided to swim after him because I thought maybe it was help. I got to the lid of the opening, and as I crawled out, I was inside the underwater building. The ceiling was as short as I was, about 5 foot 11, so I had to hunch over a bit. The walls were white but had holographic panels on the wall. I turned to find a hallway and I began to walk down it. I felt fine at first, until I rounded the next corner. That's where I found a blood trail going into another room. Cringing a little, I carried on, peeking through the door. Inside, a tall, dark-skinned creature was tearing the guy's chest open and placing a strange-looking larva inside of him. They pulled out a magnet-shaped tool and it healed his skin back up. I fainted and I hit the ground. I woke up back in my room at 11 o'clock. 11 a.m. I had overslept and I was covered in a pool of sweat. But I was paralyzed. Sleep paralysis. While this was a bit creepy, I was just relieved to be back in my room, back in the real world. But then, I saw something that made my heart pound. I wasn't alone in my room, because there was a humanoid silhouette-like creature looking at me. It reached into my ribcage, passing through my skin easily, as if it was translucent. With all my might, I forced myself to jerk up and scream, but the figure was gone, and with it, the door suddenly slammed shut. I put my feet on the floor and grabbed my field knife, opening my door. I was just in time to hear the front door slam shut too. Whatever it was had left the house in a hurry. Everyone else was sleeping, as if they hadn't heard the doors being opened and shut so loud as if they hadn't heard me screaming. I have no idea what happened to me that day, 
but it was definitely quite real. You can call the first part a nightmare, but nightmares don't bleed into reality. My mother was abducted by aliens from Mayamu. Ever since we moved into this house on Black Ranch Road, my family and I have experienced awful things. This story is about the time my mom was abducted by aliens. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy. I wouldn't have believed it myself if it weren't for these two pieces of convincing evidence. It was a couple of years ago. My mom woke up the next day confused, sore, and tired. When she told me what happened, I got chills right away. I'll tell you from her point of view. I had a weird dream last night, but it felt so real that I'm not sure it was a dream. I woke up in bed, but I could not move. I looked around me and saw that there was a small gray figure standing around the bed. I wasn't scared at first, just confused. Then one of them stepped closer to me, and I saw his eyes were huge, and he was looking at me, trying to tell me something, I think. I'm guessing I fell back to sleep, because when I came to next, I was outside on the ground being dragged across the forest floor. I was lying on some kind of tarp or blanket, and when I looked up, there was this gray figure again. He was walking beside me, but I still couldn't move, and now I was scared. I didn't know what was going on, and I was being dragged through the forest at night. I felt as if I'd been drugged. It was hard to move my head, and I eventually fell back to sleep. The next time I awoke, I was in a brightly lit room. The walls were white, and I was lying in a bed. Next to me was a very small baby, and I knew right away that that child was mine. I could feel it so deeply that I began crying and reaching out to her. I knew it was a girl, and I knew she was mine. They let me hold her for a while, but the next time I woke up, I was back in my bed here at home. That's her story. Now I get that her story sounds crazy. It's just a dream, I said to her, and honestly, I would have left it at that, until she told me the next part which had me totally convinced. That night, she had fallen asleep with her jacket on because she was cold. This was a really comfy jacket, and she was too tired to take it off. The morning after the incident, she felt something prickly and uncomfortable, and in the sleeves of her jacket, she pulled out fistfuls of pine needles from her sleeves. Now we both know darn well that she had not gone to sleep with pine needles in her jacket, we're convinced that while she was being dragged through the forest floor, pine needles had gotten jammed into her jacket. The second piece of convincing evidence is that for months before this, my mom had been having trouble with her fallopian tubes. She was in constant pain, eventually forced to have surgery, and this tells me that something had been messing around with her insides. We firmly believe that she had been abducted by aliens months before this, it caused her to get pregnant, and then eventually had given birth to this baby alien hybrid. I know it sounds nuts, but we've looked up many other stories like this, and thousands of other women have experienced the same exact thing. Coincidence? While I hope so, I don't think it is. Number 1. Desert Alien Submitted by Venom Reaper 16. I had never been one to believe in the paranormal, nothing like ghosts or aliens, but one night in late October changed my point of view entirely. It was around 10 or 11 at night when we were returning home from our grandparents' house when we noticed some lights blinking above the mountain nearby. My sister, Lucy, was saying it was probably some airplanes coordinating with one another. Since we did live by a nearby private airport, I continued to watch them 
as the lights made a sequence of red, green, blue, and white pulses. Then I looked back at Lucy, joking that it was probably aliens trying to abduct us. We both laughed, but we were kind of uncomfortable because we still couldn't explain what these lights were. We'd honestly never seen anything like it. The way they moved, the colors they were, it was unnatural. Anyway, we soon came to our neighborhood and we drove along our road, which wasn't very well maintained due to the weather and extreme heat we received that year. We jostled over cracks and potholes and uneven pavement in the black Ford that Lucy drove. We came to stop at the dirt lot next to our driveway where the truck was parked when not in use. The one good thing about our house that was nice was that it was both silent and roomy. To our left was our neighbors and to our right was endless uninhabited desert. The only house way out there in the distance was our other neighbors who lived way past where the road transitioned into a dirt path, which was about a mile down the road from us. I looked up at the lights again as Lucy began turning the truck around to back it up into the dirt lot. They were now pulsing more frequently and strongly. And suddenly, a large column of blue light lit up the whole mountainside. This sent chills all over my body, confirming to me that what I was looking at was not man-made. I began to freak out and I moved back closer to the driver's seat. Then the truck's radio began to fuzz out as another blast of light appeared like some war was happening in the mountains. This time I saw a roundish silhouette above the light. My breathing became more rapid as I screamed, what's happening over and over again. Lucy looked up to what I was freaking out about. The lights disappeared from the mountain ridge followed by a loud and deafening crack. The truck stopped and my sister stepped out to see what she had run over. Dang it, look what you did, she yelled at me. But I was shaking in fear. I wouldn't leave the cab of the truck. I was clinging to the belt that was slung across my chest. My sister saw the fear in my face and climbed back into the truck without another word. She turned the key quickly and the truck hummed back to life. The radio was now playing smoothly again, like it usually did, as my sister pulled out of the dirt lot and backed up into the driveway. She turned the cab's light on and turned her phone's flashlight on. She slowly climbed out of the truck and walked over to my side. Lucy then opened my door, motioning me to come out. I unlatched my seatbelt. I was shaking all over. I slid out of my seat, hunched over with fear. Lucy shone the flashlight in the direction of the door. It happened to be the one night my mother forgot to turn the porch lights on for us, so it was incredibly dark. But I ran to the front door and huddled by it. My sister came up behind me and unlocked the door as quickly as she could. I ran inside, straight to the room where my mother and stepfather were sleeping. They were both very much in a deep sleep. I kept shaking my mom trying to wake her up. She wouldn't listen, and at one point I was begging, tears in my eyes. Eventually, she sat up, an irritated frown on her face. My stepfather woke up after her and was asking what was wrong. I quickly explained the experience we had just gone through. They both got out of bed and followed us down the hall. I still wasn't brave enough to go outside, so I watched Lucy my mother and stepfather step outside to inspect the night sky, but they didn't see anything, except that the truck was now parked all clumsily and that we broke the small picket fence guarding my mother's cactus garden, which she wasn't very happy about. To this day, nobody believes what I saw. I'm still very haunted by the sighting, which I am completely sure was otherworldly. All those lights in the sky, and their strange, rapid movements. I wasn't sure if a battle was going on or if it was some sort of alien drag race. Either way, I didn't want to be a part of it. Number two, Sunset Beach, submitted by Tim P. The 
the story I'm about to share with you is actually two separate events, but given the subject matter and the fact that both took place in the same location, I think of it as two parts of the same story. Anyway, I grew up in a small town on the Southern Oregon coast. The beaches there are beautiful, but given the cold, wet climate, they're usually only frequented by sightseers and bored locals. The most popular of the local beaches is Sunset Bay State Park, or as the locals refer to it, Sunset Beach. It's not a large beach at all, but it's beautiful there. There are tide pools to explore, countless nature trails and hiking paths, even barbecue areas, a campground, etc. Having grown up there, I eventually began thinking of the beach as a cold, wet, windy place that was often an awful place to visit. Still, in an area with nothing to do, I often got dragged to the beach by friends and family who, for some reason, still enjoyed it there. It was on one such occasion when the first event occurred. I had gone to Sunset Beach with a couple of female friends of mine. We were busying ourselves by exploring the tide pools and taking photos of the picturesque views. When suddenly, one of us, I can't remember who exactly, spotted a strange light or object in the sky. From where we were, it looked to be a plane at first, but it wasn't moving. It was just a sort of pulsing light, hovering motionless in the sky. Then in a big, unnaturally bright flash, it suddenly vanished, then reappeared with another flash almost instantly in a different part of the sky, quite far from where it had been before. We watched it for a moment, now mesmerized. Then it happened again. It vanished in a flash, and reappeared somewhere else. This was in the middle of a cloudless day, yet these flashes were almost blinding. It did this several times before vanishing entirely. We tried getting pictures and video of it, but given how high it was in the sky, our cameras couldn't pick it up. The scene was just too bright. We thought it was weird and even kind of cool, but we couldn't be 100% convinced that it was alien in nature. Fast forward several years, I'd found myself homeless, and the only thing my family was willing to do to help me out was to get me a tent and set me up in a campground. Since you can only stay in a campground for a week or two maximum, I sort of bounced from one to the next until I'd finally stayed at most of the local campgrounds. Well, while I was staying at Sunset Beach, I never saw any strange objects or lights or anything out of the ordinary but I did hear something that chilled me to my bones. While I was lounging in my tent one day, I heard this very loud noise. It sounded like a jet flying overhead, but it was way too loud, as if it was flying just above the trees. Also, it didn't fade in or out. It just started a deafening loud sound that vibrated everything around me. I could even see the pebbles in the soil jounce around just by the massive sound of this thing. Plus, it didn't seem to be moving. Basically, it sounded like a massive jet hovering just above the trees, maybe 20 meters up over my tent and staying in one spot, which didn't seem possible. I sat there stunned with my palms over my ears. My whole head began to ache and it lasted so long that my arms grew tired. But every time I relaxed my hands, uncovering my ears to the noise, it felt like my ears were going to bleed at any second. Finally, and thankfully, the sound stopped. My senses slowly returned, and I went outside of my tent, only to find nothing. There was nothing in the sky, just a cloud here and there, but not many and there were no vehicles around. Everything seemed normal, and I was too creeped out and confused to go back to bed. The next day, which was my last day at that campground, I heard the noise again, that ear-splitting jet engine noise, but this time I wasn't as shocked, so I hurried out of my tent to see what it was. When I got outside, I could definitely hear it, as loud as ever and everything around me was still dark. I looked at my watch and it was midday. The sun should have been in the sky, 
It took me all too long to realize that the thing making the noise above me was almost completely blotting out the sky. It was flying incredibly low, whatever it was, and it was the biggest airborne object I've ever seen. Scared out of my mind, I crawled back into my tent until everything became light once more and the darkness faded. I crawled outside and looked up, and it was day again, blue skies, a bright sun, no ships in the sky. When I told my mom about the experience later that day, she laughed at me at first. She's never really believed in aliens or UFOs or the paranormal, but she then told me that several of the residents of the RV park near her and dad, the one that was just a couple of miles from Sunset Beach, had mentioned a strange and ear-splitting sound too, and they were just as baffled by it. Mind you, these are elderly residents, some wealthier than most, and they were very reasonable people, not the ones that are prone to flights of fancy. I'm 36 years old, I believe myself to be intelligent, and I'm also extremely familiar with the area where these events occurred, and I simply can't think of any logical explanations, especially for that sound and shadow. I mean, it was like standing a few meters from a Boeing 747, just as it started, then stopped its engines. It was that loud. A couple of years later, I began seeing reports online of people hearing strange, loud sounds that were seemingly coming from nowhere, and I now wonder if they're hearing what I did. Anyway, Sunset Beach is a real place, you can easily find it online if you want to visit. That being said, check it out sometime if you're interested in the unknown. You may just find what you're looking for out there, but be careful. Number three, question everything, submitted by Cole. This is a bit of a recollection of past events throughout my life that have made me question everything I've ever been taught or have believed. I'm claiming these events to be completely true and I'll tell them through my eyes. Maybe there's a logical explanation for some of this, but it's all rather strange. Either way, I know what I've experienced and I'll stick to everything I can remember. Around the year 2000, I was around seven or eight years old at the time and a Cub Scout. I joined the Scouts as a way to do extracurricular activities without having to be a part of the more jock type sports. I'm very fond of the memories I made at the Cub Scouts. It was fun and very enjoyable. I also made a lot of friends. Anyway, this event takes place in Southwest Florida where I grew up. We were at a typical weekly meeting at one of the Scouts houses this week, we were going over stargazing. So as usual, we had a short learning talk about what to look for and things of the sort. After that was over, the adults left us out in the front lawn to enjoy ourselves that night. As we were watching the beautiful night sky, the stars of the Milky Way galaxy coming to life before our eyes, one of the scouts suddenly shot up their hand to my left and they shouted, look, a rocket ship. In that typical excited seven year old voice. Now, as I recall the experience, I remember that we saw a glistening object way up in the night sky, almost like a star, but it definitely wasn't a shooting star. It wasn't moving fast enough, but it moved a bit too quickly to be a satellite. As we watched it, there were the usual oohs and ahs, as to be expected from a bunch of kids witnessing such a thing. After watching this thing cruise our sky for about five minutes, it stopped suddenly. Then, I kid you not, it doubled back. Then, at a 90 degree angle, it shot away in a different speed entirely. I could compare it to light speed like from a sci-fi film. At one point, it was moving steadily across the sky. Then, boom, it shoots off like a bullet in a different direction altogether. After seeing that, all our mouths were wide open and we were completely silent. Then as we gathered ourselves, 
we all crowded around the scoutmaster, asking him what the heck that was. We still don't know to this day. We didn't have any explanation for it, and neither did the scoutmaster. Fast forward a few years. I'm 16 years old then, living with my dad and his new girlfriend. Her place wasn't in the best part of town, but the people there were very nice, so life was pretty easy going. Now the house was built back in the 1940s, so the door had some very heavy material. I think part of it was made of steel. I'm not sure what, but probably steel. That's important, not to mention it had three deadbolt locks and two chain style locks due to us living in that part of town. Also, at the time, my bedroom window shared the same wall as the old door, which when the door was shut, it rattled my window. Things went well for the first month or so. She had a dog named Ozzy. He was a big, beautiful yellow lab, friendly and goofy as well. I spent a lot of time with him as I was home alone from about three to six in the evening. One day after school, I came home and was greeted by Ozzy. I chilled out in my room for a while when I suddenly heard the door slam shut, the door I had just locked behind me. I could very clearly hear the chains rattling and everything. So I assumed that my dad had gotten off work early. I ran out to see him because usually he brought some food home. Oddly enough, the house was completely empty. Dad was nowhere to be found. I even called out to him, but I was met by silence, eerie silence. Whatever, I'm just tired, I thought. A few weeks passed by and nothing weird happened, so I shook off the experience as probably nothing. One day I came home from school again and I got straight to doing my homework. Then I felt it, for sure this time, the vibrations of the wall. I heard the wub 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 of the window when the front door had been slammed shut. Someone had just opened our door. I jumped my feet right away and Ozzy was already losing it, snarling and barking like I'd never seen him do before. I grabbed my hunting knife and I slowly went out to investigate. There was nothing. The house was dead quiet. I had a very bad feeling, but I was ready to serve time if I had to defend myself from some armed stranger. Ozzy, however, was not only on the same page, but had seemed to take interest in growling and barking not at the door, but he was now focusing at the corner where the two walls met, right by the door. I grabbed his collar and brought him to my room. While on the inside, I felt like I was being watched and I didn't feel very safe. I stayed there, barricading my door, ready for action until my dad finally came home. I told him, and he told his girlfriend, who said that she never felt safe in the house either, that some weird things have been heard and seen throughout it. This didn't make me feel better. It sent chills down my spine, if anything. I didn't much like being there alone after that. About a year later, I'm 17 and living in Minnesota with my mom. One night during high school, me and a friend of mine were biking around town when he shouted, dude, that's a UFO. I looked where he was pointing and I saw what he was seeing three white lights in a triangular pattern. They were flowing slowly and low overhead. The lights glided by without noise, but as soon as we saw it, it had either accelerated faster than we could comprehend or it teleported. Because one moment it was there, then the next thing we knew, it was in the nearby town five miles away. We saw it slowly gliding north, just as it had been doing moments before. Over our heads, then poof, it was gone. We're not sure what we saw, and we still talk about it from time to time. I should also say that no matter where I moved, ever since the events at my dad's girlfriend's house, I've always felt that I wasn't alone, especially when I'm in my bed at night. I've been having some very strange dreams. Dreams where I'm on a table, surrounded by humanoid things, and I can never move. Maybe I had a fear of aliens growing up, or maybe something has been following me. I don't know. Well, this next event is not something I personally witnessed, 
but it was told to me by the same guy who saw the triangular lights. Let's call him TJ. He and I have been friends for two years at this point. I love him like a brother and fully trust his every word. He's also a real hard guy too. No bullcrap kind of guy. Well, he had gone on a week-long canoe trip in the Boundary Waters near Eli, Minnesota. He was going with the church group, camping, canoeing, and portaging. He said it was amazing and he loved every minute of it. Then as he told me about it, his voice trailed off and he became quiet. I asked him what was wrong and he told me, I saw something or someone that I can't explain. I pressed him for more info, which might seem rude now, and he told me this. We were canoeing across this big part of the lake before going home. I noticed an island in the distance that I hadn't seen the first time around. As I was looking at it, I saw something or someone. I asked him to elaborate and he told me this. It looked like a person. You know, a round head, torso, two arms, and two legs, except they were on fire, as if someone had soaked in gasoline and walked right into a candle or something. There was no smoke, just a humanoid body covered in flames. I looked away, then looked back. Then whoever or whatever it was, was gone. There was no sign that what I saw had ever been there and I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but throughout our entire trip there, there were these lights in the sky and in the woods, lights that seemed to come from an aircraft that definitely weren't human in origin. I was taken aback by his story, and he hasn't said much more about it since. I don't ask about it, but I still think about what he said. I can't imagine what he saw, but it can't be a good sign. This concludes my set of personal experiences with the supernatural and paranormal. Things I believe are alien and extraterrestrial in nature. It really makes you think twice about whether or not we're alone in this world. Number four, Alien Plane, submitted by ADT. I had an encounter with something I believe to be an alien spaceship. To set the scene, I was driving down a completely dark highway, no illuminating lights on either side. I was coming home from my mother's house because I'd stayed for supper and she lived a town over. I was in a Buick LeSabre 1999 and I was about 22 or 23 at the time. I was listening to the radio to keep my mind off of the darkness and how scary it is to drive at night, especially when you don't have another passenger in the seat beside you to talk to. So I just focused on the radio and my driving. I went and looked back in my rear view mirror all of a sudden to see my two children sleeping in the back very peacefully, my three-year-old daughter and my son who was going to be one. They were all out and I just had to keep driving to get home. I was driving a little faster than what I should have been because I was scared being alone in the dark like that. As I drove down the highway, no other cars passed me. It was completely clear and it was very, very weird. I wasn't used to driving at night and I was used to seeing cars pass by me at least every few minutes. So I tried to focus even harder, trying to ignore the questions in my head, the questions that were asking why this highway was completely clear of traffic. As I continued to stare straight ahead at the road, I suddenly saw what appeared to be planes above the highway road. And right away, they seemed way too close. I didn't understand why they were so low and close to the highway, but maybe it was just me, I thought to myself. And as I looked up at one of them, I slowed my car down. I wasn't nervous or scared, I was just figuring it would be safe, as there were no other vehicles on the road and I was at a pretty good wide open area. So I slowed down to get a better look, and one of these planes slowed as well, which was very unusual. I turned off my radio, which revealed a very unnatural silence. Though the plane ahead was very, very close, there was no sound coming from it. No engine noises that you would hear from a plane that is passing overhead 
or even a helicopter at that. It was silent, like there was no jet engine noise, and it turned. When it turned, I could tell it was completely blacked out. I mean, my headlights shone off the body of it, only to be reflected by a very dark surface. After a moment, I could make out that it had turned towards me, and all of a sudden, it was like the cab inside the plane lit up, and I could very clearly see the outline of a very humanoid figure. It was a one-room compartment. I didn't see his face as the lights illuminated around him. I looked at him, and he seemed to look at me, and something about his body seemed off. The proportions of his shape were all wrong in a way. His head seemed too large and top-heavy, and everything else below that was incredibly thin. Then, all at once, what seemed to be a thousand bright lights of different colors shining right at me burst into life around this plane. I slammed on the brakes, waking my two children in the back seat. We slid to a halt on the quiet road. Then, without a sound, the lights on that ship rose straight up as that thing took off into the night sky. And I'm not talking about side to side, I mean straight up, and it didn't stop going straight up until we could no longer see it. I was dumbfounded, unsure of what I just saw, and needless to say, I did not want to keep driving after that. I told myself that there was no way that that craft came from our world. I'm glad I haven't seen anything else like that since, and I hope I never have to drive that road at night ever again. And number five, Night at My Grandparents, submitted by Paul LTU56. I'm 17 and living in Lithuania, Kansas, a very nice town where I usually like to go cycling and play football or just hang out with friends. Before this happened, I did believe that aliens exist, but never once in my life did I imagine that I would in person ever see one. It all happened in 2010 when I had a sleepover at my grandparents. I had no idea what was coming. I was just finishing up watching a film when my grandma told me it was time for bed. So I turned the TV off, bid her good night, then began to get ready. Later, in the middle of the night, before I ever fell asleep, a strange sensation came over me that sent chills down my spine. Now, next to my bed, I have a big window in my bedroom. I leave the curtains open on it so that I can look outside as it's very beautiful out here. But as I laid there, trying to sleep, but being overcome with these strange sensations, I saw outside my window from the sky above these bright lights lowering and slowly approaching the ground. Whatever landed out there must have only been about 75 meters away from my window. It landed in complete silence, not a sound, even as it touched down. But those lights were so incredibly bright that it was like daytime around the house. Then I watched in fear as four strange beings stepped out of the vehicle. And of course, they appeared to be those typical gray aliens that people often describe, short with almond-shaped black eyes and gray skin. The four creatures stood there outside next to their ship. They appeared to be holding some sort of glowing device. I raised up in bed, leaning forward to try to get a better look. I was foolishly sure that they couldn't see me from there. One of them walked away out of eyesight while the others disappeared back into the ship. A moment later, I got up to go to the windowsill to take a better look. The ship was silent and still, but still extremely bright. Then I heard a very familiar clicking sound. I turned to my bedroom door, which went out to the living room. I knew that sound all too well as I've woken up to it plenty of times. It was the sound of someone turning on the lamp in the living room next to my door. I could even barely see the lamp's light coming from underneath the door's crack. I slowly approached my door and opened it, and I looked out into the living room. The lamp was on, and standing next to it was one of those humanoid greys standing in the house. It was short and very horrifying to behold. 
Goosebumps covered my whole body, and I was too scared to even move at this point, probably because the gray was looking right back at me. I had no idea how it got in our house, considering we always lock our doors. It began to walk towards me, and as it stepped closer, my vision turned to black. When I woke up, I was back in bed, and my entire body was sore. There were bruises on my arms and legs, especially my inner thighs, bruises that weren't there before. I got out of bed, feeling like I didn't get a second of sleep last night. I went to the kitchen table to see my grandparents making breakfast, and of course, I told them what I saw. They didn't even try to believe me, saying that a lot of the time, people would drive by with those blue LED lights on full blast, and that that can wake you up. But I know that that's not what it was. I got a good look at it, and I encountered something that wasn't from our world. Ever since then, I didn't go back to my grandparents. I was so scared that I'd see those grays again, and I'd wake up with even more unexplainable bruises on my body. Alien, from Sophie S. Location, unknown. I was around 10 years old. It was a summer night. I was staying up especially late and beginning to get tired. I remember at one point looking out my window and becoming absolutely petrified because I saw a pair of blue glowing eyes and a black outline of a very tall creature outside. I remember being so terrified. I threw the covers over my head and body and only after a long period of silence did I uncover my head to check the clock on my nightstand. Apparently, I'd been hiding for an hour. I glanced back at the window and saw that the creature was gone. But being a kid, I no longer felt safe in my room after that, so I decided that I would go into my parents' room to sleep. It was 3.30 a.m., and I was almost too petrified to move. I was surprised I even made it a step out of my own bed. When my foot first touched the cold wood floor, I broke into a run, quickly slamming open my parents' bedroom door and awaking them. I told my dad and stepmom about the creature that I'd seen outside, but when my dad went to check, there was nothing there, not even any tracks outside. What really terrified me about this experience was the fact that the only thing protecting me from that creature wasn't the glass in the window, because my window was open. The only protection I really had was the screen inside the window. Anyway, my parents did not believe me about this supposed alien thing that I saw, but when I double-checked outside for any traces of the thing, I found claw marks under my windowsill that I did not recognize. They hadn't been there before. Considering the thing's bulbous head and almond-shaped eyes, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I saw an extraterrestrial. There was intelligence behind those eyes, why it was spying on me like that, I have no idea, but this might explain the strange things I saw in the sky after that night. I really hope it doesn't come back. Horrifying Bedtime Experience From Sinister Phoenix and Read by Swamp Dweller So this happened to me seven weeks ago. I've never experienced sleep paralysis, so this is all new to me. My name is Leslie. It's my last year in high school and I have trouble sleeping at night sometimes. I usually get three hours of sleep every day. When I stay up late, I normally like to watch my favorite TV show. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. So this happened on a Friday morning. It was 2.30 and I am still watching It's Always Sunny. I start to get tired. So I decide after this episode is done, I would go to sleep. Once it had ended, I turned off the TV and went to bed. As I was sleeping, I noticed I was slowly starting to wake up, but my body was feeling like it was vibrating and I kept hearing a big buzzing noise. Once I got to open my eyes, I couldn't feel my body move and I couldn't speak. I could only move my eyes. I looked to the left corner and what I saw made me feel terrified. 
I saw a shadow standing there looking at me. Maybe you guys are familiar with a movie called VHS 2. If so, you remember the alien abduction scene? Do you remember how close those aliens looked? Because that's what it looked like. It had long and black fingers and long legs and they were getting closer to me. I tried screaming, but instead I was humming. My humming began slowly fading away. At this point, I tried to force my body to move, but I still wouldn't move. It felt as if my soul was being trapped inside. When my toe started to move, I woke up letting out a big gasp. I didn't know what was going on. I thought I had seen the devil in my room. I go on my phone to see what time it was and it was 4.15 in the morning, so I decided not to sleep as I had school that morning. I went to school super tired with bags under my eyes, my hair all messy, and I didn't even bother showering. I was so traumatized by what I saw. I spent days not sleeping because I was too afraid that it would happen again. I would drink Monster, coffee, and Red Bull to keep me awake. A week and a half passes and I did some research on what happened to me. I later found out that it might have been sleep paralysis. Maybe about 30% of people who have had sleep paralysis have had the same experiences I did. I haven't had anything like that happen again, and I hope I never see that alien thing ever. Outside the Window From Darth Cutie Location Unknown This was told on behalf of a former coworker of mine who now believes completely in aliens. His name is Richard. Richard is an elderly man, frail, soft-spoken, with an old-school sense of decency, opening doors for women, always saying hello. He tends the register where we work, which is at a fashion store. He's pretty calm, albeit a bit slow. He rings up customers, answers questions in a low, even voice. He doesn't seem the type to believe in ghosts or otherworldly things, but people can surprise you. And one night, he told me about what he knows he experienced, not what he thinks he experienced. This story he firmly says he's sure about. There was no doubt in his eyes when he told it, those small, blue eyes brimming with certitude. He's a believer, and he's unashamed of it. His conviction is as interesting as his narrative, so I listened attentively, devouring the story with a curious spirit. On a camping trip with a friend of his somewhere in Colorado, things started out like any normal vacation. The tents were set up, the food was prepared, the flashlights were working, and all seemed well in the world. Although the weather had turned chilly, they were pleased with the excursion. But as that night pressed on, their trip took an ominous turn. It all began with a strange noise, as many stories like these do. At first, Richard thought it was an animal, maybe an owl or some other nocturnal creature calling to its own kind. But as the noise continued, he and his friend realized it wasn't anything from nature nothing that they'd ever heard before. I asked how he knew it wasn't just some animal. He simply said he knew, he knew that it wasn't. Every human instinct he had told him it couldn't be. Then he said his instincts were confirmed when he saw this object dart across the black sky, weaving in a way no aircraft could. He was a pilot at one point and understood planes. This was no human plane. It wasn't even anything any human could have imagined. The accompanying noise, like a howl from the darkness, tore through the trees. He and his friend jumped, staring at the object, which eventually vanished just as abruptly and mysteriously as it had appeared. Richard is a conspiracy believer. He told me the US government and many governments have been hiding the existence of aliens for decades. They communicate regularly. They collude and they scheme. All the people who have seen these things, they're far from crazy. On the contrary, they're victims of a conspiracy which has very little hope of coming to light. The story didn't end there, though. He said the same noise, that howl, 
returned later that year, only this time it happened just outside his window. While he was in bed trying to sleep, peaceful silence was replaced by the familiar sound that shattered his camping trip earlier. He didn't see anything though, no UFO, but the noise was so intense this time that he shut and locked the window fearing something would break in and drag him away. Nothing did, thankfully, but to this day, Richard believes something alien, something sinister, is always waiting on the other side of our skies. What Happened? From Kylo Rain, read by Swamp Dweller. Okay, so first of all, a few weeks prior to my main experience, I saw something in the sky above Birmingham, England. I was sitting in my back garden having a cigarette and admiring the beauty of the full moon when I saw something fly into view. It looked like, well, the shape of a deodorant can, to be perfectly honest. It was flying silently across the sky with pulsing red, white, and blue lights running along the bottom of it and a bright white torch like beams shining from the top of it. It had no wings or anything of that sort. I had no idea what to think of it, but, well, there was nothing I could do. Perhaps it would be on tomorrow's local news. It wasn't. No one else seemed to have seen it. Now, on to the main part of my story. I have no idea if these two experiences are actually related, but the former seems to have some kind of relevance, honestly. So, one night, my sister was staying over with her kids. So she had my bed and I slept on the sofa. I lay down and fell asleep listening to true encounter stories with werewolves, which are my favorite on YouTube, from a mixture of all different readers. I awoke to one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. I was paralyzed and instantly terrified. I woke with my face facing the back of the sofa and my back facing out to the rest of the living room. As I lay there paralyzed, not with fear but physically paralyzed, I could feel something going on with the back of my neck. It didn't hurt but I could feel some sort of drilling sensation going on right on my spine. I tried to move, but I was not in control of my body, which was paralyzed but twitching all over, and all this time I could hear a sort of buzzing, whooshing sound. Honestly, the typical sound you'd imagine a flying saucer to make. Then, all of a sudden, a sensation of calm came over me and I thought, oh, okay, it's just a reaction from the drugs I took earlier. I just have to write it out and everything will be okay. I felt calm while trying to ride it out for a few minutes until I suddenly realized. Hang on, I didn't take any drugs earlier. I don't even do drugs. The panic ensued once more. I twitched lying there in horror for a few more minutes until I suddenly regained control of my body and quickly turned around to see the back door move as if someone had just run out. There were red, white and blue lights flashing and filling the room, and here's where I might add that my living room is on the back. We have a large back garden, and then another on the back of that. We are completely surrounded around my house. Basically, what I'm saying is we are far away from any roads, and it couldn't possibly have come from a police car or the like. Once again, the calm struck me. Oh, it's just the lights on the internet box in the corner flashing, I thought, but very quickly this time I regained my senses and realized there was no internet box. I have no idea what I was just thinking, again. It was as if someone were trying to implant imagery thoughts into my head to keep me, like, oh, from freaking out or something, I, I don't know. I was feeling very violated to say the least, honestly, and very frightened. My dog, a large Siberian Husky Arctic Wolf Cross, not easily frightened, was up on the armchair, where the hell he knows he was not allowed to go. He was shaking and refused to come down all night. Was it all the dream? Well, considering I didn't get back to sleep, I very much doubt it. The rest of the night I laid awake, still twitching and feeling a weird sensation of a cold shooting down my spine and nerve endings every minute. I don't know what it was. Aliens were all I could think, but the next day when I told my friends, they all had a little laugh, and then one said, Well, you said you felt something messing with the back of your neck. Let's see if there are any marks. They all looked, and they all sat in silence. There were three small red puncture marks in the shape of a triangle right on my spine.
Cresc Isle sequel from Silver Wolf 69. Location, Presque Isle State Park, Pennsylvania. Anyone who's been to Presque Isle State Park knows that it's a picturesque setting that seems as calm as things can be. Being a small strip of land off the coast of Pennsylvania, it's a nice little touch since I've lived in that state pretty much my whole life. But what a lot of people don't know was that in 1966, a strange report from four teenagers rocked the sleepy area. I had no idea when reading about it online that the 50th anniversary would be just as bizarre. In 2016, I decided to take some time off from the hustle and bustle of city life, and I took a trip to Presque Isle. Other than the Ben Franklin Institute and Valley Forge Outdoor Mall, it was one of the few things in the state that I had always wanted to see, but had never really gotten the chance to until I moved out. Anyway, as I arrived, I noticed that there was a ton of people in boats, canoes, vehicles, you name it. I asked one of the motorists why there was such a commotion today, and he told me, Don't you know what day it is? July 31st. It was right here 50 years ago that teens saw a UFO land. We're hoping for something similar. <laughs> I'll be famous. I told him that I honestly doubted one small UFO sighting would bring him fame, since he was one of at least 60,000 people who would immediately say, I believe in aliens, if they were asked. Me among them. I decided that as long as those people kept quiet, I could still enjoy my time there. As it was still the early afternoon, I decided to do some exploring, but things soon got weirder. I encountered a small group of hippies playing music and singing The Aliens Will Come and Take Us Away to a place where we cannot trek. Rather than talk to people who may be legitimately insane, I decided to instead walk past them. As I did, I caught a small glint of light out of the corner of my eye. I whipped my head in the direction I saw it, but saw nothing. I decided that it must have been a trick of the light. As I continued walking, I saw four people with telescopes. When they caught me staring, a little boy dressed as the prototypical alien for Halloween, as in he was dressed like it was Halloween not three months away, told me, we don't want to see the aliens, we want to see the ship. Though the majority of people there were strange, it was very nice to see so many excited enthusiasts. However, that small glint was still gnawing at me. If I had known that that was a preemptive to a grand finale, I would have just rolled with it. At 10 p.m., I was just relaxing in my car when a small group of people started shouting and pointing. I scrambled quickly out of my car, dodged a guy holding a sign that said, abduct me, and I looked up. I saw a small object in the sky doing nothing. Due to depth perception, I would say it was probably 20 feet long and 10 feet wide. There were flashing red and green lights on it, and you could hear a low humming sound. As it got closer, there was a bright flash of light and then everything went black. When I woke up, I checked my phone and saw that four hours had gone by. I looked around and saw three small things. They were about four feet tall and had pretty normal sized heads not the bulbous ones everyone talks about. When I screamed, one of them turned around. It just stared at me with green eyes, and I almost screamed again. That was because they actually looked like people. I had always been told how aliens only resemble people, but the resemblance here was extremely unnerving. I quickly jumped into my car and hauled tail out of there. The next day, I got a strange visit that I really wish was a dream. There were two tall, suited men at my door, and just like anyone would, I immediately thought, men in black. One of them asked me, Did you visit P.I. yesterday? I assumed he was talking about Presque Isle, so I said, Yeah, I visited there yesterday. What's wrong with that? Is there a problem? The man replied, We're with the Pennsylvania UFO Research Organization, or PURO. 
I asked if he needed something from me and he said, we're here concerning any possible video or photographic evidence you may have gotten. We ask that to avoid any hysteria. We want people who may have witnessed strange things at PI to delete evidence of these contents until we and the government can work together to figure out just what happened. Now, I had recorded some video footage of the strange thing in the sky, and I had no plans to give it up, considering just how strange and awesome it was to see. But what I wasn't expecting was for the other silent guy to grab me by the shirt, then say in some indiscernible accent, for the sake of your wife, delete the video. I did as they said, tapping the video icon on my phone and deleting the file. Without another word, the two of them turned around and left. I've heard of MIB stories before, and some people believe that the MIB themselves are actually aliens, aliens disguising themselves to keep their cover. If they were from Puro, why would I have never heard of that kind of institute? If they weren't, who were they really? And where were they actually from? After that experience, I didn't feel safe for a while. I wanted answers, but I have a feeling that I wouldn't like those answers. Aliens in Sweden from Bellamy and read by Swamp Dweller. The following is a two-part story set in southwestern Sweden about a 10 kilometer drive away from Gothenburg. The first part of the story happened to my friend. It was summer evening and my friends were just out playing near the roundabout and relaxing. The sun had set for the night, but it's quite bright at night during the summer around here, so there's usually enough light to continue playing long into the night if one wishes to. The village has only about five or 600 residents in it. There weren't many cars that passed through. My friend, was talking when one of them noticed in the distance some strange figures moving about. Telling his friends right away, the others looked into the distance as well. They saw four or five completely white humanoid figures darting back and forth across the fields. They would run into view between a couple of garages before dashing out of view on the other side of the garages. It almost seemed as though they wanted to be noticed. My friends thought it might be someone pulling a strange prank, but... The strangest part of it all was the complete paper white look they had and their strange, deliberate run. It almost looked like they ran on their toes, hunched forward, flailing their arms forward in a crawling motion. Another strange thing was how they didn't make a single sound while running back and forth. This unnerved my friends who began shouting questions about what the thing was. The reason I believe my friends in this story is the look on my friend's face when he told this. We'll call him Joe. He looked quite unnerved, and I have never seen him look so serious up to that point. What he saw clearly bothered him. An alien sighting in an Albanian village from Chasm T. I live in Tirana that is the capital of Albania, but I come from a small seaside village in southern Albania. It is not one of those paranormal weird villages. It's a beautiful place where me and my family still go every two months or so. We still have a house there and my grandparents live in that house. This isn't the most horrifying story, but it definitely spooked me when it happened. It was a regular November night we had a pretty big fire going on the inside of the house, and it was getting really hot for me. I decided to spend a couple of minutes outside. I was looking up at the sky full of stars. I turned around to the sea nearby and noticed a cruise ship in the distance. This was nothing strange because cruise ships passed by here all the time, but what grabbed my attention was how bright the lights were. They were hurting my eyes bright, because of that, I decided to look at the stars again, only to see this weird-looking string of light twirling in the sky like some snake. I closed my eyes and opened them again, 
thinking my brain or vision was playing with me. But there it was still. But suddenly, it just took off into the night sky, only to burst into a million fragments that seemed to fall over the ocean. As I looked out to sea, I noticed the cruise ship lights were being dimmed until they completely went off. I also noticed that everything was quiet now. Even the insects had gone silent. As I got back into my house, I noticed my dad trying to fix the TV because it had gone out as well. When I asked him what was wrong, he was telling me that somehow the TV just went completely crazy before going to static, then shutting off. Now, I'm pretty sure that wasn't some Air Force top secret plane, because the Albanian Air Force only has about 20 rusty helicopters, and the same goes for the neighboring countries. Not to mention nothing strange had ever happened here before. What I saw in the sky that night, it was the most bizarre and surreal thing I'd ever witnessed. Close Encounter From Unknown Read by Swamp Dweller This event took place in September of 2017. I was visiting my longtime friend Mark, who was going to college about four or five hours away from where I lived on the west coast. Mark's girlfriend Karen and another friend of ours, Shin, packed up a car and drove out on a Friday afternoon. The drive was uneventful for the most part. At one point, we held condoms out of the car window while going 90 miles per hour. We parked roadside and watched one hell of a sunset. We arrived late that night and met up with Mark who gave us a tour of his dorm, again uneventful. After an hour or two of playing pool in the rec room, Mark and Karen declared they needed to go and have some alone time, as Mark's roommate would be out of town. Shin and I didn't love the idea of paying for a hotel, but Karen convinced Mark to pay for one, so we didn't have to do it out of our own pockets. Shin and I were cool with this, and so we left for our hotel. Upon arrival at the hotel room, Shin starts up a Skype call with his girlfriend, who couldn't make the trip. I asked him if he wanted to go out to the farmland outside of town for some long exposure shots of the stars, but he declined. I was bummed at this news as I didn't know how to work a camera for the long exposure shots just yet, and I really needed Shin's help. That's when I remembered what part of the state I was in. There was nothing but small towns and rolling hills for miles. Freight trains in the middle of the field are easier to paint than in the industrial district of a major city with no one around, besides the occasional college couple trying to, you know, do the do. Yes, I do paint trains when I have some time and money. You paint a train and it travels all over the continent. Some people do drugs for their high while I see panels of trains traveling to cities I'll never see and get a high off that. Small world stuff, you know? Anyways. I let Shin in on my plans and soon got the keys to the car, which Karen let us borrow, and left the hotel. I stocked up on paint at Walmart before driving through a couple of towns in a roughly an hour and a half time frame. I scanned the railroad tracks in both towns I passed through, but sadly I found no freight cars for which to create my art. My sadness did not last long, however, as I entered the third town and found several hoppers and gondolas parked between the wheat fields. I soon parked at a gas station and went off behind it, into the darkness ahead, trying to scan for cars that didn't have paint on them already. I eventually found an old Canadian grain car, one of my favorites, and began to go through my bag of paint to start an outline. I quickly found some gloss, white paint, and began to work setting up a milk crate, so I can reach higher up on the train. Fifteen minutes into painting, I hear a low gurgling sound about ten to twenty yards to my nine o'clock position. I look around myself, so afraid of some farmer or something, maybe he found me or a gas station attendant on his break. Strangely, however, I see only a single tree in the darkness, at the edge of the fields. I debate using a flashlight, but I decided against it, worried someone will see the light and I'll get in trouble. The gargling sound soon stops, but then picks up in 3-5 to five second intervals. I began to become extremely curious about the source of the noise. As it was 2 or 3 in the morning and I began thinking, no one else could possibly be around. 
I used my hand to cover the LED light as I turned on my flashlight before flipping it on, pointing it at my chest first, then my feet, and finally, the tree. The moment I did this, the gargling noise faded out, and there was a dried up embankment between myself and the tree that figured must be a farm runoff due to the familiar smell of cow patties in the air. I say familiar because I used to live on a farm in the Midwest for about a year. The only thing I noticed in the embankment is a fuzzy, tan bump. I didn't wish to walk towards it, so instead I climbed up on the ladder on the hopper I was painting. As I'm climbing, I can't help but feel like I'm being watched, as a sense of dread overcomes me while my back is to this thing and I'm climbing. Taking a look back at the gas station, I see no one. The only cars in the parking lot were mine and whoever the attendant is in the gas station. As I stared into the parking lot, I suddenly hear a rustling noise from behind me. I turn, flipping my flashlight on again only to realize the tan thing in the embankment was a dead deer. From my higher position and upon further examination, I realized it wasn't as tan as I thought it was initially. I could see a slight gray and purple which I assumed was the start of decomposition of the animal. There was quite a bit of blood from a small wound in the deer's belly, which bled into the dirt. As I stare at the deer I hear a sudden snap which jolts me and I quickly climb to the top of the train car and watch closely at the tree in the distance. I found myself frozen in place as I tried to use visuals to look for any sort of movement near the tree. This is when I saw it. In a small area between all the branches in the lower left area of the tree, I saw little beads of white eye shine move into place. At first I assumed it was a possum or raccoon. Eventually it became obvious it was way too large to be either. This gave me chills. I kept telling myself no, 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 as this thing parted branches in what I assumed to get a better view of me. Getting a better look at the creature, I noticed it is smaller than I initially thought, skinny, and it's a grey looking humanoid figure. Standing on top of the train, I shivered as this creature opened its mouth and let out an identical sound to a cockroach hiss. As soon as I heard the sound, I got the hell out of there. I made a beeline for my car. I heard one last faint hiss as I made it to the lights that lit up the gas station parking lot. Jumping in my car, I sped off, blasting music and using my brights all the way back to the college town. I was more hysterical than scared as I fantasized about a grey humanoid creature popping out in front of me as I sped down the road. In the end, I made it back safely. I broke one of the passenger side speakers in Karen's vehicle from brassing music so loudly and so long. I remembered that I'd also left spare cans of paint and the milk crate back at the train cars when leaving in a panic. I kicked myself at the thought of that spot would likely be compromised now as they no doubt would have security out there in the future. Eventually. I figured it was for the better, however, as I didn't want anyone experiencing what I did out there that night. Due to the events of that night, I always stick to cities now when creating my art. I figured I'd rather run into a thug than whatever it was I ran into that night. Please take a weapon and a friend if you ever wish to wander into the boonies. You never know who or what you'll run into. Our Encounter with Aliens from Ellen M. Location, Ohio. This story is about my brother Alec. The story begins in Ohio with Alec, who is three, and Abigail, who is six. They were there with my mother Olivia. They were visiting Olivia's brother Elliot in a small town in Ohio. We went to church with Elliot and some family members. As we were coming home from church, Elliot saw something in the sky. The three of us were in the back seat playing and talking to each other. As we were going down this country road, Elliot saw there was no one following him, so he decided to stop and get out of the car for a closer look at the object in the sky. The three of us stopped playing and were now watching what the adults were doing. Elliot pulled over and got out. Then Olivia, who was sitting at the other door, got out. Then suddenly Elliot hollered at Olivia, telling her to get back in the car because he was going to get home as fast as possible to call the police. She quickly listened and said, Elliot, what are the police going to do? He replied, I don't know, call the military? It looks like we're under attack, Elliot's wife Isabel said. 
They don't seem hostile. The three of us were looking out the window, and all we could see were stars. We arrived home, and Elliot went to the phone. The object was over the house. Elliot told Isabel to hide us kids, to which she replied, But where? In the closets, Elliot said. Elliot got on the phone with the operator. They quickly answered and said, Operator 9, how can I help you? Elliot replied, I need the police. He was put on hold for a moment. Still on the line, he went over to the window and looked outside. Soon the operator came back and said, I'm sorry, sir, but the police line is busy. Would you like to hold? Elliot quickly said, Yes, please. About ten minutes went by, and finally the police were on the line. Police, what's your emergency? Elliot said, Thank God. There's this huge aircraft above the house. It's a triangle shape, and there's lights all underneath it. But oddly, what the police said back was, If it's above your house, sir, there's nothing we can do. We can get someone to eventually come out from the military to make a report. When Elliot pressed the police officer on the other end, the police explained, Sir, you're the fifth caller about this. I'm sorry, I have to hang up now. He quickly looked back up at Isabel and asked if the kids were in the closets now. She said yes, but said that she believes that that thing lands, then we're all going to perish. Olivia agreed. Elliot went outside, and the two women followed. Apparently, despite the size of the aircraft and its close proximity, it was completely silent, just sitting in the sky, as if it wasn't there at all. Eventually, a police officer actually did show up which was unexpected. Elliot quickly met him and asked what he thought that thing was, to which the policeman replied he didn't know, that he'd never seen anything like it. After a lot of time had passed, the kids were able to come outside and begin to play. Soon we stopped and watched the policeman and Elliot talk. Then without any warning, the craft above us suddenly took off. The speed at which it moved was impossible, and it left no trace in the sky or below. Did you see that? Elliot said to the policeman. What in the world? The policeman muttered. What do you have to say about that? Elliot asked. I, I don't know. I don't know how to report this, the policeman responded. Then he left. Elliot shooed the kids inside and had them ready for bed, while Isabel and Olivia were dumbfounded. That's, that's it? Isabel wondered. After the kids were in bed, they turned on the TV to see if anything would be shown. The news did report this, talking about a strange object that had been seen in the sky. Over a thousand people ended up reporting it. The Air Force had been called, but they hadn't responded at that time. Soon they all went to bed, confused and hoping the thing wouldn't come back. We assumed that that was the end of it, though. One bizarre, unexplainable sighting for a lifetime. But something happened in 1979, particularly to me. I was lying in my bed. I was having trouble sleeping, tossing and turning. At one point, I turned over on my back and opened my eyes. And there I saw at the foot of my bed a creature that you would now call a gray. It didn't have a mouth, but I heard it somehow speaking to me. And I remember word for word what I heard it saying. Tonight, you perish and you go to hell. I screamed for Albert, my sister's father-in-law, to bring something to protect me from the man in my bedroom. I ran to the front door trying to get away from the monster. When I turned back toward my bed, ready for the worst to happen, ready for it to pounce on me or something... I saw that I was alone in my room. Eight years after my incident, my brother Alec had his encounter. He was 23 at the time, and he was living in a cabin in the hills of West Virginia. One night he was getting ready to smoke. The night was the same as any other. The crickets were chirping peacefully, and he had a coal fire going in the cabin. It was a pretty cold night after all. Then suddenly, all the noises went silent. Alex said he had been so involved with what he was doing that he didn't pay attention. Then out of nowhere, the cabin lit up. The light showed every crack in the walls that were open. 
Alex thought it was the police. He took his stash and pried up a board on the floor of the cabin. He put all his stuff there and closed the board again. Then he walked to the door and kept waiting for the police to knock. But Alec never heard it. As he was opening the door, the light was so bright outside, it hurt his eyes. He shouted, Who's there? But no answer came. Alec closed the door and head under his bed. The next thing he knew, he was awake in bed, and he didn't know how he got there. The coal fire was out too, even though he said he had enough coal in there to last for two days. But the fire was out, and the coal had all burned up, and his memory was blank. Alec moved out of the cabin and never went back. About 15 years later, I was in the Bahamas with my daughter and her friends. One night, my boyfriend and I went out to dinner, and the four young adults stayed in the boat. When we came back to the boat, my daughter told me that the four of them were sitting on the front of it when some sort of object came over the boat and hovered there. She said the last thing she remembered before blacking out was looking up at it. The next thing they knew, they woke up in the cabin. No idea how they got there. I'm beginning to believe that aliens work with families that they have encountered. They stick with generations of families, haunting them, following them, and probably even abducting them. A few of us in the family believe that, but we keep it to ourselves, as we don't want people thinking we're crazy. My Cousin's Alien Encounter From Lil Miss Mystery Location Washington. This story is directly from my cousin and two different people who had been there that night. My aunt and uncle live about 20 miles outside of Forks, Washington, in the middle of the woods on a large plot of land. One night, my cousin and his friends had been joyriding in his truck around the property. They had decided to drive out to the lake, which is halfway to Port Angeles, Washington. He says that they had stopped in a secluded spot to smoke and relax. He swore to me that they hadn't even started when they saw these weird flashing lights in the sky above the lake. One of the girls that they were with was begging my cousin to drive back to his house, and he decided that that might be a good idea. But the other teenagers that were there that I talked to said that when they took off, they watched the lights follow their car all the way back to the family's property. They swear the lights looked like a triangular-shaped craft. The teenagers were freaking out, so this meant my cousin was driving recklessly down mountain dirt roads. When they reached the house, all of them ran inside. My cousin grabbed my uncle's AK and loaded it. My aunt and uncle were asleep in the other house on the property. The other teens said while he was doing this, they could see the bright lights flashing in the windows and one of the girls even claimed to see a weird inhuman face looking through the window of the house. My cousin let loose his four massive dogs, then walked outside, then began to use the AK. The dogs disappeared into the woods like they were chasing something. They said that the lights soon disappeared after that, and the group went to my aunt and uncle's house and slept in the living room, huddled together, too scared to be at the other house. They wanted to be away from their encounter. Number 1. Gazebo Experience Submitted by Venice D. I was always a very outgoing child. I didn't always live in America. For the first five years of my life, I lived in the Philippines. I had a grandfather on my mother's side, that passed away two years before I was born. He was buried in this traditional Chinese cemetery since he was half Chinese, and his siblings wanted him to be buried there. So every year, we would go to that cemetery with my grandma, my uncles, cousins, and parents to celebrate his birthday or to just randomly show up and put flowers on his grave. It was a time for my family to come together and celebrate his life. My grandma is a really chill person, so when my parents would not be able to show up, she let me roam around the cemetery as much as I want for however long I wanted. I liked playing with my cousins, pulling pranks on them, playing hide and seek and whatnot. 
but I also liked playing by myself. Half the time I was there would be spent just wandering off. This was a huge cemetery, and there were iron fences all around it, so even though it was huge, I couldn't run away just like that. I knew every inch of this cemetery down to where certain shrubs were. This is important because of the next part. As I knew every inch of the cemetery, I would notice when something showed up that was out of place. It was Chinese New Year, and everyone in the family came to pay their respects to grandfather. It's not like here in America, where a deceased loved one is mourned forever. In the Philippines, we take that time to celebrate their life. I was around five years old at the time, and it was my last year before my family moved to Pennsylvania, so I decided to give it one last walk around. I was walking for maybe 10 minutes and came across a clearing. The sun was golden and everything around me was illuminated. It was beautiful and there was tall grass surrounding me. And then I saw the gazebo in the distance. I don't ever remember seeing a gazebo here and I had a really good memory and layout of the whole cemetery, but for some reason, I'd never seen this gazebo before. Surely I would have seen it being built as we came here often, but it literally just appeared. Anyway, I was drawn to this gazebo. I remember it being an off-white color and it looked like a fun place to play in. So I began to walk towards it and when I got there, I remember just running around it and walking back and forth. This is where the weird things began. I was standing in the middle of this gazebo when I hear the weirdest noise in the whole world. It was like a guttural engine noise. I have no idea how to describe it beyond that. With that noise came a strange high-pitched sound that hurt my ears. I tried looking around me and then all of a sudden, the sounds stopped. It was quiet again and I couldn't hear anything but I could see the tall grass swaying in the wind, except I couldn't feel the wind or even hear it. And then I see a strange thing peering out from behind the grass. It was small and about the same height as my five-year-old self. I could hear it making clicking noises. The being or whatever it was, was coming just into view. Then suddenly, I was back with my family near my grandfather's grave and they were packing up things to go home. The sun was fading and I was just standing there dumbfounded. What in the world happened? I don't remember much after that. I just remember going home and thinking it was a strange dream, but I knew deep down that it wasn't. I know the difference between being asleep and being awake and I had been very much awake. Growing up, I remember having the incident just randomly pop into my head, but I would always brush it aside as it made me feel uncomfortable. But a few months ago, I finally decided to confront the memory. My grandma lives with my family now here in America, and I decided to ask her about things we used to do back in the Philippines. I asked her about the cemetery and she smiled and said I would run around a lot and annoy all the older cousins. I asked her if she remembers a white gazebo. At first, she said no, and then asked me to draw it for her. So I drew it, and she shook her head and said there was no such thing. I then asked her if there was a time when I was gone for a long while during one of these cemetery outings, and she shook her head again and said no, because the cemetery was fenced in. I decided to drop the subject until she told me about one incident where I was acting really strange. I pressed her on the subject and she told me that the last time we were there, I came back after playing, she said, with a strange look in my eyes. I asked her, what do you mean exactly? She told me, you were always smiling and laughing, but the last time you came back, you looked extremely upset like something was bothering you. For a week after that, you were so violently sick, we had you in the hospital. After that, I dropped it. I don't know what happened to me in that cemetery. And at this point, 
I don't think it's a good idea to keep remembering it. I'm not really sure about paranormal things being real, but I have no explanation for this. I don't know what I saw or what I heard that was making those mechanical sounds, but, and I promise I'm being 100% real with you here, sometimes before I fall asleep, I swear I can hear that same clicking noise. Number two, Alien or Robot, submitted by Darth Exodus. Me and my best friend Kevin often drive around looking for abandoned places to explore and creep ourselves out in. In rural Tennessee, we ended up finding such a place, an abandoned house. We went inside. The place was absolutely trashed. There were empty bottles everywhere, trash all over the place, torn up furniture, and even a smashed TV. We went upstairs and found mostly empty rooms, save for a bedroom that had an intact bed and a bunch of evidence that someone had too much of a good time in here, if you catch my drift. Then we decided to look around in the basement and to our surprise, there were no creepy surprises, no signs of a weirdo having been there. It was around that time that we heard something coming from just outside. I slowly made my way over to the small basement window, and I saw something bizarre standing just outside the house. Believe me, it was the last thing I expected to see. I expected to see some teens hanging out, some suspicious man walking about, or maybe even a nocturnal animal exploring like we were. At least something like that would make use of the trash around us. But this was different. The thing was about seven feet tall, and its waist was slightly thinner than its hips and upper chest. It seemed to be covered in some kind of metal. The feet were very reptile-like, it had thin, but very strong looking still arms. I counted six fingers on each of its hands. The way it looked, it was like some sort of hybrid between machine and organism. And my very first thought was this was some sort of weird taxidermy art. But then I saw that it was breathing. I heard Kevin behind me. He gasped even louder than I had. I can't say I blame him. This was the most bizarre thing we'd ever seen, and I think both of us were questioning our sanity. When the creature jerked its head towards us, my heart pounded so hard it was painful, but luckily the thing didn't see us, apparently. The thing was just looking around the outside of the house, but then it disappeared out of sight and soon we heard metallic clanking on the floor above us. It had entered the house. I began to panic, and I thought of an idea that might save us. There was an old screwdriver on the ground in the basement. I grabbed a hold of it, opened the window, and threw it out a bunch of trash that was on the lawn. It made plenty of noise. Then we heard the sound of those footsteps coming more rapidly, going back outside but we didn't move from the basement just yet because the thing had stopped outside looking around the area the noise had come from. We must have waited in that basement for another half hour before the thing had disappeared into the woods. Only then did we feel brave enough to run out of the house at full speed. As we drove away down the road, I swear we saw strange lights in the sky and I thought at any moment a light would appear right above us and we might never be seen again. I don't know what we saw that night. Maybe it was just a man in a suit looking to scare kids away from the property, Scooby-Doo style. Maybe the house had a gas leak or fungus that caused us to hallucinate. It's just extremely hard to believe what we saw that night could possibly be real. Number three. They Come at Night, submitted by Geodis. 
I did not believe in the paranormal, did not believe in ghosts, angels, demons, or hauntings. I truly believe anything can be explained away by science or even tricks of the mind. Unfortunately, what I experienced here is something that I cannot explain. To me, it was as real as it could get and more terrifying than you can imagine. Now, I've been sleepwalking since I was a child. I've also fallen victim to lucid dreaming. I go to sleep and often wake up in random parts of my home. Every time I wake up, I see things watching me. The typical alien gray looking things. Not some 3D rendering, not CGI, but skin and flesh creatures peering out at me. I can see the texture of their skin, the moisture on the surface. I can see them blinking their eyes. I can see spasms in their thin muscles as they walk. I cannot say that they are aliens because I don't want to jump ahead to conclusions, but I do know that they're real. Unlike thousands of so-called abductees, they didn't take me aboard any ship. They don't even talk to me or probe me or anything like that. They don't share secrets with me. All they do when I wake up is stare at me from a distance. I can't communicate with them because even though I'm awake, when I see them, I cannot move. I cannot speak. They just watch me for a few minutes, walking amongst each other. I know what you may be thinking. I'm just imagining things, right? Wrong. I've been home alone with my younger brother. He's never had one of my experiences. But one night, everything changed. While my parents were gone, he and I fell asleep on the couch in the living room while watching a movie. I woke up to my brother calling my name, not screaming, but calmly calling out for me. I woke up and turned to him. He was staring at something across the room, and I could see a look of terror in his face. Without turning, I knew what he was looking at. Then I did turn, and I saw two of those same beings looking at us, just blankly staring. My brother and I were actually able to speak and move, but we stayed still and were too afraid to actually say anything to them. But my brother did start crying and he began to ask me, what did they want? I said, I don't know. I said, we'll be okay that they'll leave soon. After another hour, they finally left. It's been months and he hasn't seen them again nor have I. I'm not sure what is happening, but I'm glad to know that I'm not crazy. Number four, Alien Brain Scan, submitted by Eddie Word. I was 13 years old at the time, living in almost the middle of nowhere my house was relatively the only building on this street, with many fields all around us. Now to the story. It was late one night, and I was heading off to bed. Usually, I left my old TV on as a sort of nightlight, because, to be honest, I was afraid of the dark. At the time, I noticed that there was a light shining from under my door from the next room over. Right after I closed my eyes, I reopened them to see nothing but darkness, no TV light how I'd left it, no light under my door like I saw, not even moonlight from my window. Then I noticed that I had been strapped down as all I could move were my fingers and toes, but that's it. I couldn't even move my head, but I could feel straps on me. For some reason, I didn't scream. I sat there thinking, what is going on? I looked around for a few seconds. Then I heard a strange noise coming from directly above me. The only way I can describe the noise is like the noise you'd hear from a steaming boat engine mixed with the sound you'd expect from swinging a thin stick through the air quickly. 
This went on for about an hour, though it was probably only a few minutes. Then I heard a knock that seemed like it was coming from my door, but like I said, there was no light from the door. But after the second knock, all of the light quickly came back at once, and I was left in my bed with all the blankets on the floor, and the straps were gone, yet when I looked at my skin, I found rectangular marks where something had been pressed hard into my skin. If you have any idea what I experienced, please let me know. And number five, The Creeped Out Kid, submitted by Eric. When I was younger, around six years old, I was just like any other normal kid. I played outside every day, rode my bike as much as I could with friends in the neighborhood. I never really got into anything scary or even gave it that much thought until I was caught in the middle of something that defied understanding and explanation. I lived in South Carolina in Orangeburg, which is in a much older part of the state. There are historical buildings, large Victorian-style homes, and historical colonial sites abound in that region. The house I lived in was an older home built in the 1970s that had a fairly unique style. It had a full concrete porch that was built into the house so that the roof of the house actually covered the open porch as well as the rest of it. If you came in through the garage on the left side of the house, if you were facing it, you would walk into the small kitchen. Then you would walk into the living room which had a back door into the yard. Our hallway was off of the living room and it was T-shaped, having bedrooms on both sides of the top of the T. My parents' bedroom was off the left of the side of the T, along with a guest room. On the right side was my sister's room and my room was adjacent to that. The layout will become important later. My room did have a large window that went from the floor to the ceiling on the wall that overlooked the front yard. This large window would become the source of a lot of paranormal experiences. This all began when the movie E.T. came out on VHS. My dad had picked it up for me and my sister from school, and we were going home. He said he picked up this new movie, and we were going to get pizza and watch it together on my dad's large screen projector television. I was a kid that was afraid of anything creepy at the time. So I naturally asked my father, is it a scary movie? It was my go-to question for new movies we were going to watch because I was not going to sit through a terrifying movie. My dad, being a prankster, told me, yeah, it was horrifying and that it was the scariest movie he had ever heard of. So I naturally didn't want to watch it. I remember sitting at the kitchen table from which you could easily see into the living room and even watch the TV. I would sneak peeks at the movie. Certain scenes stuck out to me, such as the E.T. creature in the cornfield jump scare that caused my gaze to go away from the TV for a while or to make my arms hide my head. But as the movie went on, I had this stigma of being nervous and scared. So now anytime I saw that creepy long-necked alien, I was horrified. The next big scene that absolutely scared me was when E.T. was sick and he was all white and reached up to the camera for help. The creepy white E.T. definitely stuck into my head for a while. So I was introduced to the most terrifying alien monster the world had ever seen in E.T. As times go by in that house, things begin to happen that were unexplainable. Cupboards would open randomly the fridge would open by itself. Any visitors that we got at the house always felt uncomfortable. Often my parents would send me to my room to get something or to put something away, so I would run as fast as possible to get down the hallway. Then I would kick on the light so that I could have light as soon as possible. The entire time I'd run down the hallway, I had this feeling of being chased. I would turn around and swear I saw the shadow of something disappear, and there was this evil feeling throughout the hallway. Other times, I'd be sleeping in my bedroom. We had bunk beds, by the way, 
and I'd be facing the large window in my room. Through this window of terror, I would see shapes of things running across the yard. I even saw what appeared to be large white E.T. with glowing red eyes and sharp fangs staring at me through the window. I've seen this image so many times that my parents were used to it. They, though, did not believe any of this, as I was just a child with an overactive and scared imagination, even though they all had their own experiences in the house. Because of the strange window to apparently another world and the other things that scared me, I usually moved my bed several times so that I would not have to face the window or the open doorway. I often had friends over as well, and I would never mention any of these things to them that I've seen because I didn't want them to think that I was scared of my own house. On one such night when friends were over, we were staying in my room and had broken apart the bunk beds to make two separate beds near each other. They were facing the hallway door from my room and the door was closed. I was just about to go to sleep when I saw some light slowly creeping into the room from the hallway, like the door was slowly being opened. My heart, of course, began to pound and I was getting that terrified feeling all over again. I looked into the hallway from the room and I saw a whitish gray hand holding the door as it was being pushed open. At this point in my life, I was terrified of aliens of every kind, the grays being the one that made my skin crawl. So the white hand moved aside and in walks two alien grays. They were wearing this black skin tight garment of some kind and they walked into the room between the beds. My eyes were the only things peeking above the blanket. My friends were asleep in the other bed and on the floor to my right. I was in the bed to the left. The greys looked around and at us and at me, and then turned around and left. The second they left, my friend on the right of me freaked out and asked me if I had seen it too. I told him it looked like aliens. I was apparently smiling as I was glad that someone else had seen them. His brother woke up also and spoke up, saying that can't be real. I felt so validated at that point, it was comforting. I feel I owe a little backstory about the aliens as well. My mother was a hardcore alien UFO conspiracy nut. She had her own experience in that house with these alien greys and a UFO allegedly landing in our backyard so I did not know how to take that as truth or not, considering I thought I was dealing with demons. However, when I did see the ET thing out of my window, it was always lit by some giant bright light from the back, something I felt that the entire neighborhood should have seen. I'm also reminded of the movie Dark Skies, where everything going on in the house seemed and felt paranormal, but it was aliens in the end. After all those experiences, we had a pretty solid basis of a steady haunt going on in our house, and for some reason, I was in the middle of it. A few months later, I was asleep in my room on the bottom bunk. My mother was a nurse working second shift, which would end very late at night around midnight. She would park in the garage and walk through the kitchen down the hall and go to the left to her room. Keep in mind, she has to walk through the living room to get to the hallway. After she was in her pajamas and ready to settle down for the night, she had an odd feeling to check on her kids. As I now have kids of my own, I know that feeling. So she went down the hallway to my sister's room. She saw her asleep and fine. Then she went into my room and looked around, but could not find me. She called my name and started to panic, walking through the house. I wasn't in any other part of the house, Feeling frantic, she checked my sister's room again, then the guest room, her room even, and then went further through the house. She found me sleeping on the couch, tucked into a well-made bed. I had a sheet under me and one on top, and I had a pillow under my head and a large and very heavy wool blanket covering me up, tucked into both sides. I looked extremely cozy, apparently. My mother was thoroughly confused as she had just walked into the living room from coming home and I was not on the couch before, so she decided to wake me up and ask me how I got there so fast. She shook me awake and asked, 
My reply still creeps her out to this day. I had said, that nice man picked me up and put me here. Instantly, she was scared and ran throughout the house trying to see if anyone else was there, but there wasn't, just my dad snoring in their bedroom. Now, from what I remember, I was asleep in bed and I was on the bottom bunk and on my back when, all of a sudden, I woke up. I do not know how, but I was just awake. I wasn't tired at all, and I wasn't scared this time. Then I saw a man lean over the bed and look at me. I remember his face so well, even 30 years later. He reminded me of Jesus, like what the artist's impressions of Jesus look like. He was wearing robes and everything. He looked down at me and said, we're going to put you somewhere that's safe. I remember being lifted up, but I was still lying down completely. I remember being carried out of my room. It was as if I was floating down the hallway. I saw the top of the bathroom go by, and I was then put down on the couch and tucked in, and the bed made real quickly. I fell back to sleep, only to be woken up by my mother, who was asking how I'd got there. I'm guessing that that finally got to my parents, as they had a priest come to the house and bless it and remove any evil in it. I think things finally calmed down a bit after that. However, I still felt wary of that house. When we moved away finally when I was 13, it was a freeing experience, and I felt a lot better afterwards. A while after that, we ended up asking the new homeowners later if they had experienced anything in the house and so far they haven't, so I suppose whatever it was had finally moved on. I don't know if it was aliens or demons or whatever, but I do know that this was far from normal and not of this world. A few days ago, me and my family, along with a few family friends, took a trip to Roosevelt Lake in Arizona. Roosevelt Lake is one of the largest lakes in Arizona. It's about 22 miles long and 350 feet deep. This lake was a usual camping spot for our family and group. My parents' friends brought their kids, so naturally we stuck together camping. It was nice too, because we walked down the shore a ways before finding our own little cove to nestle into. There were six of us that would go to the cove and talk and hang out. I suggested we try and stay up late that night if possible, and many of the others were down. At about 8.30, we took some lawn chairs and took them down to that cove. As the night progressed on and on, we could hear the adults getting drunker and drunker, and even louder. At about 10.15, we spotted something floating across the sky. It was a glowing orange light. We all watched in silence as it floated overhead then simply vanished without a trace. Once it vanished, we were all in silence for a while until we began to argue about what it could have been. Honestly, we had no idea, but my friend, let's call her Mandy, suggested it was just a helicopter. Another friend of mine named Nate stated the obvious, saying that helicopters can't just disappear like that, not into thin air. After a while, we kind of forgot about it, and at about 11 that night, we spotted something sitting on the lake. Two green orbs seemed to be hovering right above the water, about 30 feet across from each other. They sat near a buoy, just sitting, not moving at all. Mandy was the first to point them out, and at first we thought they might be anchors from the buoys, but we soon discovered we were wrong. Minutes later, a red light appeared on the lake, hovering like the other two green lights. Soon that one red light split and became two. The second floated across from the lake, away from the first one. All four lights then formed a perfect diamond, floating above the lake. And I'm not exaggerating when I say it was a perfect diamond. It looked like something from a geometry textbook. We tried to make excuses for these lights, like anchors or buoys, boats, fishing nets, but none seemed to add up. Nothing seemed to make sense. The night continued on, and we all began to get tired, and soon at about 2.30, we were all back in our campers, sleeping peacefully. 
The next morning, we all woke up about noon, and we talked about the lights from the night before. Mandy brought over a three-man canoe that we wanted to take out to the buoy to look for anything that could have been making those weird lights. So Mandy, Nate, and I paddled out to the buoy, and there was nothing there. No anchors like we thought there could be. Nothing at all that could have been making those lights. So that night, we were determined to see if the lights would come back. We stayed up as long as we could again. At around 10.17, we spotted the orange light floating over the lake again. We watched as instead of it disappearing, it floated down into the water. And I'll be honest, we kind of panicked. We calmed down and got our thoughts together about what we were seeing. We reminded ourselves of our goal, to understand what was going on. At about 11.15, splashing could be heard. Using our flashlights, we scanned the lake's surface, and as we scoured the lake, we heard this hum growing from a drone to nearly unbearable. Soon the sound echoed throughout our cove. The flashlights then flickered off. Nate cursed as he smacked the flashlight in his palm, trying to get it to come back on again. Luckily, the full moon was out, and that was enough light to see three silhouettes. They were very tall, much taller than any of us, and extremely thin. Their hands were huge, and their hands were as well. They were walking towards us, walking on the water's surface. We all hit the ground, watching them get closer to the shore. When they were about 10 feet from our shore, 10 feet to being right on us, the flashlight switched on again, and my heart skipped a beat when I truly saw them. Mandy screamed, and so did Nate, and honestly, I did too. These beings, they were pale, so pale we could see what only seemed to be veins running over their bodies, but they were very scrawny and bony. Their eyes were massive and solid black, and their mouths opened unnaturally wide, releasing these screeching noises that echoed through the cove. As quickly as the creatures appeared, they sunk very fast into the water. We lay there on the ground still, afraid for our lives, waiting for something to happen. The cove was silent for a second, and then we got up, and our footsteps were the only noises we could hear, especially as we ran back to camp. We didn't tell our parents what they saw because we knew they wouldn't believe us. The next morning, we packed up our things and we left. The only conclusion me and my friends could come to was that there was something otherworldly in that lake, something that we're not meant to see. Number one, an alien encounter in Suffield, Ohio, submitted by Bolligard. My name is Justin, and in this story at the time, I was 14. I'm 19 now, and I'm ready to tell this story. During one summer, my brother's cousin and I would usually go on late night walks on this back road called Wingfoot. All that was on this road was a blimp base and a cornfield. Suffield is nothing but farmland, mostly. Dean and Doug are my cousins, and they live across the street. Jake is my brother, and I'm also the youngest one out of them all. Jake and Dean decided to go out on a walk while Doug and I stayed over at my house playing Halo 3. They were gone for an unusually long time, so Doug and I got curious as to why they were taking so long. We decided to go out and look for them on Wingfoot, this road was already scary, just because it's completely dark until you get close to the blimp base, and on either side of the road, it's nothing but woods. We walked down the road and saw Jake and Dean sitting under a light in the road. Then Dean yells out to us, Doug, is that you? He sounded scared, which made me kind of nervous. I was already a bit creeped out from the walk. We approached them, and Doug says, why are you guys sitting underneath this light? Jake replies, me and Dean sat down and just started talking and Dean says, what the heck is that? I look behind me and I swear to God, I saw this tall gray thing with black eyes. 
It was just watching us talk when I saw it. Then it bolted off into the woods. At that moment, whether I believed his story or not, I proclaimed, I want to just get out of here. I want to go back home, so let's go. Doug, of course, did not believe Jake or Dean, so he insisted that we stay so he could see for himself. So despite my urging, we stayed, yet nothing happened for a long while. Doug started to make fun of Jake and Dean for lying and making up such a stupid story, but never once did they deny it, and they looked very serious. We started our walk home, and as we were walking past the blimp base, I looked to my left, and clear as day, standing in a field just watching us, I saw it. I, I couldn't even speak, I was so scared. It didn't take long for Jake to see it too, and then he said with a stutter, I, I, tol I told you, I wasn't lying, look. When Doug looked and saw the creature, I had never seen him run so fast in my life. So did Jake and Dean, of course, but I was the slowest out of them. And as they ran for their lives, I began to cry and yell at them. Wait up, guys, please. Luckily, at the upcoming train tracks, they did sit and wait on me. But as we caught our breaths, none of us knew what to say. Eventually, Jake broke the silence. Well, I guess we can all agree on what we just saw back there. What do you think it was? Doug asked. I think we just saw a gray. We all need to agree here we saw nothing and tell no one. This is our secret, because everyone would think we're crazy if we told. But why? Of all places, why would it be in Suffield? I asked. Look around, Justin. There's farms everywhere. There's a lake here. There's also a blimp base. It's quiet here. It's out of the way here. It's almost the perfect spot to take samples. Jake explained to me with a very solemn look on his face, and the way he had said samples, it made me shiver. It's safe to say that there was no sleep among us that night, and I'll never forget what happened on Wingfoot. Older and braver now, I still go on that road at night just to see if I'll ever see that creature again. Number two, Transparent Ship, submitted by Kenyatta B. I live in New York City, and I grew up in Borough, the Bronx. I was meeting a friend one day to exchange tape cassettes that we discussed over the phone. When I got to the block I was supposed to meet her on, I happened to look up, and that's when I saw something I just couldn't believe. It was supposed to be a normal day. I never would have guessed I'd see something like this. What I saw was a huge ship shaped like a triangle. It stood completely still above one of the buildings of my house and complex. I saw two men sitting on a stoop talking, so I told them to look up, and I pointed in the direction of the ship. They looked at me like I was crazy, as if they couldn't see anything. So I crossed the street to get a better look. When I was there, on the other side of the street, I was right under it, looking right up at it. From this point of view, it was transparent, but I could see right through it. I could see the clouds, but the outline was still there. It was solid, but from the previous side of the street, it was solid. Soon, I spotted my friend. I motioned for her to hurry over to me, and when she reached me, I pointed up and told her, look at that. She said that it must have been an airplane or something, and I replied, how does that look anything like an airplane? And how does any airplane just stand completely still in the middle of the air? As we gazed for a few more moments, she seemed to get frightened. Then she said in a worried voice, we need to go. As we walked, the ship followed us, flying slowly, and even I started to get scared. Why was it following us? When we reached the corner of the block, we turned onto a street leading to the building I lived in. But thank God, the ship kept going forward. My mother and my little brother experienced a ship just like it, not too long after. It seemed to keep up with the taxi that they were riding in. I don't know what that was we saw, but it is definitely one of the more eerie things I've ever seen. Number three, I want to know what tried to attack us. Submitted by Jax. 
This happened on my local reservation with my two friends back in September of 2016, not too long ago. We're all three native, them from a Spokane tribe and me, Yakima. We've been friends since about 2008 and back in September, we decided to go camping. The boy, let's call him Dan, and the girl, May, went to their res. Dan lived there, so we just met up with him at the falls. It was a popular place, and we thought that we were going somewhere we've been, but he took us out to a new place, higher in the mountains. I was unsure about this at first, but the place turned out to be spectacular. We decided to set up camp, and we came a bit early, so we were just smoking and drinking and whatnot. Eventually, we thought it'd be fun to go on a hike to kill some time. The falls were about two miles away from where we were, and we didn't have time to walk there. Besides that, Dan and I had back and knee problems and didn't fill up for that long of a hike, so we just drove his truck. We parked at the road and then hiked down from there, and it took about two hours from the falls and back. That whole time, though, I felt very uneasy, very on edge, and I had no explanation for this. I later found out that Dan felt the same way, that he didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. But at several points in our trip, on our little hike, I felt eyes on me from somewhere in the woods. The whole time me and May were just giggling and laughing most of the way back, and as I was climbing back into the truck, I heard the weirdest noise. I'm not really used to being in the deep woods like that, so I simply brushed it off. We got to camp with fun conversation and we started a fire. We were talking, reminiscing, and just catching up when suddenly Dan stood up and he told us to stay put. He went to get his rifle from the truck. I began to get chills. Why did he need his gun? He went about 15 yards away and me and my girl were just sitting there watching and then we heard it. It was a high-pitched, inhuman sound, unlike anything I've ever heard before. Even Dan didn't know what it was and the moment we heard it, I got goosebumps all over my body. I watched closely, and then Dan came back, yelling at us to get in the truck and to not get scared. Then he fired a couple of shots behind him. What the heck was going on? We ran to the vehicle, and then we jumped in in a hurry, keys in the ignition already. We heard Dan fire three to four more shots. Then we watched as Dan ran to the fire and began to stomp it out. We rolled down the window, and he looked so terrified. We have to get out of here, he told us. Follow me. Now, Dan is the guy you rarely take serious. He was the class clown, the joker, the prankster. But I took his word for fact at that moment. Why? Because I've never seen that look on his face, that amount of seriousness, that level of fear. So it chilled me to realize that what I had been feeling that previous hour on the hike, it was correct. Something had been stalking us back to our camp. He got most of the fire out, then ran to his truck and drove over the little bit of embers that were left. Now on this side of the mountain, the road was narrow, so May and I couldn't turn around in our car until he moved his truck. Anyway, it took us far too long than I was comfortable with to get out of there, at least an awkward 45 seconds, but we finally did and we were going down this rough road that Dan was used to driving on, so he was going about 60 leaving us in the dust. May was not at all used to this, and this was her new car, so she didn't want too much to happen to it. So the most I saw her go was about 40. We met Dan down at the gravel pits that were about six to seven miles down. When we were all there, he got out of his truck and I rolled down the window, and that's when I started to get answers about what had just happened. It was probably the quickest conversation I've had. Dan said to us, I don't know what was up there, but it definitely wasn't some regular forest animal. I replied, I felt something stalking us the whole time on that hike. He said, you felt it too? Yeah, so what was it? I asked. Dan answered me. It was like this awkward four-legged creature. It kept making that ooh-wah noise, and it was very, very fast. It dodged every one of my shots, at first, I just shot a warning shot and said you're not welcome here or to go away to scare off whatever it was. At that point, I wasn't sure if it was just some animal or a stalker, but soon I saw it. I heard it on the road in front of me and immediately I fired at it. Then I heard it on the rocks to my left almost instantly. The thing was incredibly fast. 
I fired at it again, saying to just leave us alone. And then I heard the footsteps get closer, and I had no other choice but to run. May and I were dumbfounded, just listening in awe, because this seemed so surreal and horrific. Basically like a nightmare. The two of us had just been city girls for the past year, and then this just came right out of left field. May spoke up all of a sudden, interrupting us. Hey, guys, hush for a second. We sat there and listened, and then we heard it for sure this time. It was that same creature. It must have been following us all the way down. We heard the gravel on the hill next to us kind of crumble down as if something was walking, and I got scared stiff. I didn't have the guts to look in the mirror, and neither did anyone else. Dan just sped off, and we followed suit. Luckily, by now, the road opened up and was paved, so we were able to follow side by side. We were going 60 out of there, and we were just praying that we were outrunning it, that our vehicles wouldn't spontaneously break down or something. The main road back to town was another four miles away, and we made it there and drove all the way off the reservation. Then we called Dan in our car and said, we should probably find somewhere else to spend the night. We haven't told many people about this experience because we're known to be the less serious of our crew and people think that we smoke weed too much. But honestly, it got me more aware of my surroundings and I'm thankful. That night, we set up camp at a deforested lumber place pretty far from the main roads. We set up a fire and our sleeping arrangements. May and I were way too scared to sleep alone in our car, so we slept in the back of Dan's truck. Before we fell asleep, Dan and I started talking about what had happened again, and that's when he told me about the hill next to the one he had brought us to. Later on, his uncle and dad and a few more people explored that hill on a hunting trip, the same hill we had encountered that creature. They stumbled upon a cave. It had very weird markings on it. They were machine precise, not to mention unlike any other markings we'd ever seen, no one recognized a bit of it. There were also dozens of animal skeletons in the cave, and the smell was terrible. At one point, they noticed a very bright light coming from the end of the cave, but the group was too panicked and scared by everything they had found, so they ran out of the cave and back down the hill. I have this strong urge to go back up there this summer and try to figure out what it was, but I'd like a better hint of what I'm getting myself into. But even if I don't find more information on this creature, I will go back because I need answers. Number four, Gray New World, submitted by Supermom33. I've only told this story to those I trust. It took me weeks to get to a point where I could even tell my closest family member. I struggled for a long time trying to wrap my mind around what I'd experienced and all the new information I was given. I was immediately left wondering if I might be going crazy. After a few days of nonstop research, as if I was being driven by a motor, I came to terms with my reality. What I had experienced was real, and thousands if not millions of other people already knew what I know now, and I know thousands have had strikingly similar encounters. Before I tell you this story, you need to know that I've never had any encounters or beliefs in extraterrestrials before this. All my supposed information on the subject came from movies and documentaries like those on Netflix, like The Fourth Kind, E.T., etc. Stuff I thought was mindless nonsense to entertain you. Now that I've experienced something myself, I have watched just about every alien movie out there, but before my initial encounter, I had not seen too many. And even still, I never took them seriously and assumed all of it was for entertainment. And to be honest, I was always afraid and freaked out by the thought that there was even a small chance that these encounters could be real. I remember thinking many times growing up and even as an adult, if they're real, I hope they never come for me. And that's as far as I ever got on the subject. Although I've always been intrigued by the possibility, I never truly believed. All of that changed on June 23rd, 2016. I was having an extremely normal day. I would even say I was having a really good day compared to most. I felt great, was in a great mood. Everything was going right. I was expecting my husband home for lunch, which at that time was a normal occurrence. 
He was probably just 25 minutes away when it happened because he arrived about 10 minutes after I came to. The whole experience definitely felt like it lasted 10 to 15 minutes and when I came out of it, only 10 or 15 minutes had passed, so I was lucky enough not to experience lost time. It was around noon on a really nice day in Missouri. I had gone into my bedroom and was thinking about the fact that my husband was on his way home for lunch. My mind was very clear. I would tidy up the house and wait for him. Looking back now, the only thing out of the ordinary was that I was feeling very calm, very serene. I was in my room at one point, standing practically in the center of the room. I was probably just about to turn and walk out to finish tidying up the rest of the house when I suddenly felt very strange. I couldn't put my finger on it. I was off, and for the next 15 minutes of that moment, I don't remember anything except literally just standing still, thinking over and over, this isn't right. It was in a curious, hmm, I wonder kind of way, not a frantic or frightened way. Then suddenly, there were a lot of things going on in my mind simultaneously. Thoughts, memories, feelings. I couldn't figure out where they were coming from, but the thing was, they weren't mine. It was confusing, everything was all jumbled together. There was no way I could sort any of it out. It was like switching through TV channels at lightning speed. But through all of this, I felt very serene still, even while being confused. Almost like when you're about to fall asleep, except I was very wide awake and was not tired at all. 10 to 15 minutes later, my head began to clear and I walked around just trying to put my thoughts together. I was asking myself tons of questions as if I was going to have an answer. I knew I wasn't sick. I knew I hadn't fainted. I don't have any previous medical conditions and I don't take any medications. Soon and finally, my husband came through the door. I acted normal. But after a few minutes into us eating, I began to feel like I couldn't stop myself from telling him bits and pieces of something, something that I suddenly began to remember. I was telling him in a confused way because I thought, these are not my memories, this must be my imagination. It felt as though these memories were pushing their way into my brain and forcing themselves right out of my mouth. After I finished explaining or trying to explain to him, my husband just kind of stopped what he was doing looked at me quietly for a second and then said, that would be a great story for a book. And then he went about his business. I, I couldn't stop wondering what was going on with me. I was confused at the fact that these memories felt real as if I was really there in them. I was remembering more and more every hour. It got to the point I was remembering so much detail that I went ahead and typed it all up. Those 10 to 15 minutes that I had been stuck standing there feeling foggy my consciousness had actually left my body somehow. I was suddenly outside of it. In an instant, I was in a quiet neighborhood, a very nice neighborhood. There were nice little houses, perfect grass and sidewalks and roads, though everything was much smaller than it was supposed to be. It was a sunny day with a few gorgeous white clouds, a perfect temperature, and there was no breeze at all. Next, I began to notice that there was a car-sized black ship looking thing with an opening on the front. It was about 10 feet in front of me. I did not see anything underneath it and it was not sitting on the ground. It was floating. The inside rims of the front opening looked silver, but I could not see anything inside because it was pitch black. Suddenly, I noticed that there was a being about two and a half feet in front of me and I began to realize that I couldn't see or feel my own body. I never looked down or anything, I just knew that I couldn't see it, not my hair or my nose. I didn't know what was happening or how it could be, but in the moment, I wasn't worried about a thing. I immediately began to pay attention to the being in front of me, what he was telling me. His face and body never moved. Actually, nothing ever moved, not the ship, not him, no breeze, nothing in my surroundings. He expressed many things in a very short amount of time. I would feel things that I had previously thought were physical feelings. In that moment, I realized that it wasn't our body that feels these things, but our inner being, our consciousness. I was feeling a great love radiating from this creature. It was more intense than any love I've ever experienced. I would describe it as the feeling of being in love with a significant other, the love for your children and your pets, all rolled into one and intensified. Instead of crying about it though, I instead felt very at home. I felt very connected to this being. I trusted him. 
I was happy to be meeting him. I wanted to make sure I paid attention to anything he would say. At the same time that he relayed information to me, I began to finally notice his outside appearance. I mean, it was there before, but I didn't really care until now. He was what people would call a gray alien. He was just a few inches shorter than me, and I'm five foot three. I would estimate that his eyes would come up just to about my nose. The top half of his head was big, and I had obviously seen something like this on TV before. However, he was larger than expected. I actually got distracted for a minute, thinking to myself repeatedly, the head is far bigger than I thought. His eyes were the typical black and slanted almond shape. The black of his eyes were like nothing I'd ever experienced. Instead of being eyeballs, they seemed more like holes. They were so deep and infinite. Those eyes in themselves were their own experience. His mouth was most definitely small, and like the rest of him, it never moved. He seemed to be communicating all his information and feelings to me telepathically. I never communicated back to him though. I stayed in a trance-like state the entire time, trying to remember everything he wanted me to so that I could take it back to my world, the physical world. Then I briefly saw two other greys sticking their heads and a bit of their bodies around the corner of either side of the ship's opening. They gave off their own unique energies, just like the one in front of me. I could feel who they were in an instant. I knew they were not interested in me, they were strictly there on business. They didn't attempt to communicate, but they didn't mean any harm. What the main gray in front of me was telling me was that in my lifetime, we would see money cease to exist. He said we wouldn't need it. This was a very new idea to me. He told me that fashion, popularity, jealousy, ownership, and marriage, even raising our own children, would no longer be a thing. He took me to what must have been the future in the blink of an eye. I was standing beside a podium, I looked and felt like a congresswoman. This may not have been me as this is not on my list of dream jobs, but maybe someone else's perspective. And behind me stood about 30 to 40 gray aliens standing very still. There were three rows of them with about 10 to 12 every row. The person whose perspective I was in stepped up to the podium and began to speak for them to the fellow humans. The people before me were wearing pale blue colored shorts or jean like materials and pale yellow or white colored plain tees. One lady was wearing a scarf and a few others were wearing their normal clothes. Apparently society for the most part had begun to live the way that the greys had told us we needed to live. Then the grey told me something that was very strange. He told me that he was me, only 327 years in the future, that I was a past life of his. These greys, they had no emotions, at least not comparable to ours. He said that they had manipulated their DNA to the point that they could no longer procreate. As a solution, they began to clone and hybridize. He said eventually, humans would stop existing as we know them now. He said that I had somehow volunteered to come here. He explained that each human is not just themselves, they are much more. They have many lives, many existences. Their mission each is to help humanity in their own way, help Earth and spread the truth about their true existence. He said that time does not exist, that someday when humans leave their physical bodies, that they will simply return to the planet of their choice, to their real homes. He showed me mine, which was apparently in the Pleiades. I suddenly began to feel a swirling in my gut, a feeling of homesickness. He suddenly took me out into space. He showed me galaxies, planets, and other things. All the while, I could not stop exclaiming that this is so amazing, that it's gorgeous, that this is incredible. He then told me that God is real, that it is the energy of love and light. And before bringing me back to my world, he told me that me and my children are protected, but he deliberately left out my husband and he would not tell me what we were protected from. All of this happened so fast and it's so bizarre, but I believe it to be fact. We're not alone. We never were alone. And to Artorius A, who submitted his story like mine, you aren't crazy and you're not alone out there. And number five, Aliens Abducted Me During Sleep Paralysis. Submitted by Riley H. I'm a 17 year old guy this happened to me on the hottest day in June of 2016. My mom and stepdad were both at work. 
My mom usually left around 7.30 in the morning and she would always wake me up before she left. Fast forward a couple of minutes, I watched the news until it went off sometime around eight. I then grew very tired, so I dragged my mattress into the living room and put it on the floor. After laying down on my mattress for about five minutes, I began to doze off. A few minutes later, I remember dreaming and hearing voices. I then woke up screaming and sweating. I was surrounded by metallic walls. I was no longer home and around me I saw two figures standing over me. Their skin was a yellowish tone and they had green eyes. They were injecting my arm with some type of chemical and right when they spoke to me, I closed my eyes and screamed as loud as I could. But when I opened my eyes again, I was back in my living room, but in the same position I was. Now my eyes and jaw were burning intensely. I believe that day I must have been abducted during a sleep paralysis episode, or maybe the paralysis was induced. Let's just say that I never slept in my living room again, and I didn't get much sleep a long while after that. Let this be a warning to you all. When you sleep, you're vulnerable and you never know what happened when all was dark. Number one, The Face, submitted by Sanjeev2224. I usually would be asleep by 8 p.m. every night. I had to be at work by 5.30 every morning, so I made sure to get my sleep. One night though, I was awoken by a bunch of dogs barking loudly I was very confused when I woke up because I was not in my bed. I was actually in the middle of my street, just walking. I found out the dogs were barking at me. At the time, I realized that I had no control of myself. All I could move were my eyes. The next thing I remember was I was walking to this wooded bike trail area near my home. As I crossed a little bridge, I knelt down on one knee. With two hands on my bent knee, I peeked through some trees and bushes and saw a craft of some type. It was ball-shaped and had no lights. It landed under these huge power lines. I never saw it fly from the outside. As I looked at the craft, an opening opened up. Then two small beings came out of the craft. The next thing I remember was that I was boarding this craft. As I walked onto it, the two beings followed me into it. The craft was kind of cramped and dark, but there was a neon kind of glow to it. I then bent down and asked the being where we were going. They answered me and they said that they are taking me behind the moon. I then asked why. They said that they could not be detected by the earth from there. I said okay and then we took off. I looked out of some sort of porthole or window type thing and saw us leaving the earth. We passed the moon and then we made a U-turn type of turn back. It only took us about 10 seconds to get there. For some reason, the whole time, I was not scared at all. Actually, I felt like I knew them. The next thing I recall was the only time I was really scared. I woke up again, this time naked in a funnel-shaped pool filled with a greenish-black gel-type liquid. The pool had to be about 20 yards wide all around, and it was really deep. The pool was made of some kind of shiny metal. With the gel, it made the surface very slippery, and you would slip under the gel if you tried to get out. I then realized something very odd at the time. I was not alone. There were at least 15 other humans with me, all of them screaming and panicking. This is what scared me. I didn't know what they were screaming about. I thought they knew something that I did not, so I got scared as well. Somewhere under the gel moving around I could see. Most were trying to escape. One man kept climbing halfway out, and the closer he got to the top, he would get hit by some sort of beam, and then he'd slide right back into the pool. I thought this guy was just insane. If he did get out, where would he go? Then I heard a voice telling me not to be scared. They told me I would be fine and that I could breathe the gel. They said I could eat it and digest it too. I couldn't drown in it. It was impossible. We could live in the gel. It also recycled human waste back into itself. I believed some of those humans were in the pool for years by the way they've been acting. And after a while, I myself got used to breathing under the gel because I did not want to get hit by that beam and slide under. A few moments later, I blacked out. The next things I remember are some pretty vivid memories, but I do need to let you know that I am deathly frightened of frogs. I know it sounds crazy, but it's my one phobia. It's their skin. Now, back to the story. 
I was rudely awakened by a being that was armpit high, holding my hand, taking me somewhere. I remember that touch of their hands had woken me up from my unconsciousness. I tugged away and started to threaten them. I clenched my fist like I was going to fight. I said, get away from me, and if they touched me again, I was going to do something. But he told me if I tried, it would change the world as I knew it. I don't know what he meant, but I did not have a good feeling about hitting this thing. Not to mention I felt like if I hit them, I would get a mess all over myself. They seemed slimy or translucent, if that makes any sense. So I was kind of stuck in defending myself or making a huge nasty mess all over me. That's when I realized that I was communicating with them without using my mouth. I knew what they were thinking and they knew what I was thinking. It made things difficult for me at first. And that's when the smaller beings brought over this taller one. It was actually taller than me. As the taller being approached me, he told the smaller one that this is a prophet, or the prophet. I looked at his face for maybe half a second. His face grossed me out, so I never looked at him again. If I looked at him again, then he'd know how I felt about his appearance. I didn't really want to offend him, because I liked this one. He made me feel more comfortable. He explained that they wanted to do some medical examinations on me, and if I would cooperate. So I made a deal with him. If they did not hurt me or scare me anymore, then I would do it. He promised, and then he allowed them to do what they wanted. He also said that he would answer all my questions that I had. He walked me around as we talked. I looked at the ground the whole time so not to look at him. The next thing I remember was the medical examination. I remember coming out of another blackness. I was not scared whatsoever though, I trusted them now. And by being able to read their minds, I knew that they weren't lying to me. As I remember, they took some skin from my right arm. It was like the thinnest layer possible unviable to my eyes, but all they needed. They then took a semen sample. I didn't understand this. Again, I won't go into too many details about this, because by then the story would be about 900 pages long. Later on, I asked about this procedure. The last thing they did to me was the strangest of all. They took my right eye out of my head. I could actually see with my other eye, the back of my eyeball and a cord or veins connected to it and I instantly asked about this. Then they put something metal in my eye socket. It was about the size of a broken piece of rice. I asked, what's that for? They said they would use it to monitor me from space. I thought it was so they could see everything that I could see, like a video camera or something. They then put my eye back, and that was that. Everything went black again, and I woke up. My next memories were of the taller being and I talking. This was the best part, because he answered my questions and showed me things in my head. I don't recall the exact order of my questions, but I asked away. I must say that they communicated to me like an adult would talk to a five-year-old child, with simple words, stuff like that. I thought it was funny. Anyway, the first question was about my semen. Why did they need that? He literally told me they would be making baby humans in space, and I simply replied, oh. As I asked more questions, he put visions in my head. In an instant, he showed me how they do it. As we were walking and talking about the humans in space, he walked into this doorway that you can't see until you're touching it. Just as we were talking about humans in space, these two kids about 13 and 15 years old, one male and one female, turned to look at us. Both were human. They looked like full-blooded, perfect human beings. They were both sitting down facing away from us. They then turned around and looked into my eyes and then the tall one introduced us. They turned around and continued to do what they were doing. Believe it or not, they were either controlling, driving, or operating the craft or building we were in. They were in control of operating something. This really freaked me out, because they knew what they were doing, and they were just little kids. The aliens trusted these kids. It was crazy. And being that you can read minds in this place, I knew the kids weren't scared or uncomfortable. They were programmed to master their job. There's much more on this scenario, and I've only scratched the surface. As we left, I noticed he was taking me somewhere else. This was kind of confusing to me also. This time, it's like the room just appeared around us. We were just instantly inside of it. I think it's their doorways. They're unexplainable. Next thing I see is a dead cow hanging up above us. It was hanging head up and rear down. Nothing to my eyes was holding it up, though, so it seemed to be floating. I was baffled. I know cows can weigh hundreds upon hundreds of pounds, but it was just effortlessly hanging there. 
Next thing they did was lower it or dip it into some kind of gel in a box-shaped pool just big enough for the cow to fit in. Strangely enough, the gel did not overflow as they heaped the giant animal inside. The pool was filled up. Next, they lifted the cow and it was cut, dead, and I was starting to get scared. I thought I was next, but then he showed me why they do this. It all related to the humans that they had in space. He said, what do humans eat as a child or infant? And I said, milk. And he said, exactly. What do adult humans eat? And I thought, hamburgers and steaks and food like that. And again, he said, exactly. Then he put a vision again in my head and explained it all. They can't just take earth cows into space. They do just like they told me. He said that they make their own cows up here. Germ-free, no fleas, no illnesses, pure cows. They were pure, just like the space humans. They were perfect specimens of their species. Like I said, I have much more information on this topic. I then recalled the thing they had put in my eye and I decided to ask about that. They told me that humans do it all the time as well. He explained it like this. How does a tiger explain to itself when it hears a helicopter coming out of the skies in the jungle? It's a big, metal, scary object. They all of a sudden feel a pain in their hip. They then lose all control of everything except their eyes. Then these creatures emerge from the object and start to do things to the tiger, like tagging its ear, like even taking teeth, like taking semen to preserve their species from extinction sometimes. Basically, scaring the crap out of the tiger for its own good in a way. Number two, Real Life X-File. Submitted by Nick and Ellie. My name is Nick. I live in a nice apartment in the middle of town in the Midwestern region of the United States. I love the paranormal, the sky, and as I type this, I listen to the most chill music ever with my Shetland sheepdog. I am a 16-year-old male. It was around 2 or 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but I had been staying up all night playing video games, trying to enjoy a Saturday that's already left. Ellie began to whine and I realized that, being the horrible pet owner that I am, I really needed to take her out so she could potty. She was watching me as I fumbled around for a sweater and the dog leash. I swear she's like a human, but a whiny little perfect child kind of human. It's cute when it's on a dog that should be a model dog that you would see in those movies or on commercials. I hooked her onto a leash and walked out into the brisk air of the night. Honestly, I've always felt safe walking around at night because both the police and fire stations are in view of my apartment. I walked Ellie for a little while and eventually got to the dog lot where pet owners let their dogs go to the bathroom. It was nice and quiet and I listened in one earbud to Fleetwood Mac singing the song Dreams. Yes, I remember the song. It comes back to me whenever I even leave my apartment. I started to scan the sky. I loved looking at the stars at night. I also got excited when I could spot satellites. I can usually tell they are satellites instead of planes because it's a moving solid dot that is crossing the sky in such a fluent motion. I closed the gate to the small dog lot and let Ellie off of her leash. Then I looked back up to the sky and I was delighted to find a satellite in view. I watched it for about five solid seconds until I had realized that there was a second dot moving in the sky. It was even moving in the same direction and speed. Something was wrong, but I hadn't realized it yet. Fleetwood Mac had stopped singing at the wrong time, yet the background music was still playing only it had started to slow down. All of a sudden, I had started crying and I sat down. I was not sad at the time, I was just confused why this emotion had come over me. I kept watching those satellites until they disappeared, but not over the horizon. They faded right into the middle of the sky, and as soon as they did disappear, I doubled onto my knees and I threw up, barely missing my legs. Ellie was completely unaffected, she was still pooping or something. I stared upwards and looked for the satellites, as soon as I did, I could no longer see, and I have no idea why. I had gotten nothing in my eyes. I put my hands up to each eye and they felt normal. I was panicking and I started to call out for my dog. She obediently came over and started to lick the tears off of my face. My earbuds started emitting strange noises like beeping and white noise and non-human swishing sounds, and I was becoming truly terrified. These swishing sounds sounded like the excess air you hear coming out of someone's mouth as they whisper loudly, and I was sure as hell it wasn't on my Spotify playlist. Hearing that noise while seeing that blackness freaked me out. I felt around for my iPhone 6, and I turned the flashlight on successfully, and I shined it close to my face. As I blinked, the light began to come back. 
I stood up and looked around, but my eyes were trying to adjust back to the darkness from the flashlight. I was relieved to finally see, but I was still insanely scared about those satellites I had seen in the sky. Maybe they were government secrets or phenomenon from space yet to be explained. I knew though that it couldn't be the third option because I knew I was being watched. I know you guys know about that feeling of being watched. Everyone does, but do you generally know what direction you're being watched from? I'm not sure if it's normal, but I always know from where I'm being watched. At school, whenever someone's looking at me, I turn around and stare right back into them. Well, I couldn't look into anyone's eyes here. I could only look up. You can say I'm being too much of a believer that it was more than just a phenomenon, but this felt like an episode from the X-Files. Even as I'm typing this out, I wonder if it was just a time loss. I think that alien abductees always report time being lost and malfunctioning technology, but they also report strange animal behavior. Ellie was being more normal at that point than I was. It's confusing. And sure, there's some light pollution out there, but not enough to affect whatever those dots were. There were also no clouds that night in the sky, and there was no one I could see to bear witness to what had happened to me to prove it. I also haven't told my mother or sister about it because they really, truly would think I'm a liar. But what if what's up there is actually real like I think it is? What if those were government aircraft? Why would they do that to me? And what if they were aliens? What am I supposed to do? I don't honestly know. But when it comes to being afraid, I don't worry about the things that are down here with us. I'm mostly concerned or afraid about what may be up there and what might happen if I look up again. Number three, Locked in a Cage, submitted by Huxneeb. I was 17 when this happened. It was in 2012. It was a normal night. I ate my dinner, played some video games, showered, and went to bed. Everything seemed normal. That night though, I had the most horrific nightmare. I was lying in bed, my room exactly how it was when I went to sleep, when something with long arms pulled me from my bed and through my window. My window was on the second story, so that's pretty much impossible. You'd need a ladder just to get in, and I always kept it locked. Everything went dark. After I was pulled, I woke up cramped inside a medium-sized cage, almost like a dog cage. It was so bright in the room, almost blinding. Still, I was able to make out some shapes and figures. There were about three other cages all like mine, sort of in a circle, around this long shape. I assume it was a table. I heard lots of buzzing sounds and whimpers, but not much else. So I started to scream, Let me out! What the hell is going on? I wasn't given an answer. I tried to reach up and shake the cage. And that's when I realized my hands were tied together with some sort of weird material. If I had to describe it, it was like heavy air wrapped around my wrists. My eyes started to barely adjust to the brightness and I saw figures in these other cages. Other people have been taken as well. I could see these tall, slender things standing out there, hovering over us, watching us. I started to scream again. Let me out, I said. I I'll kill you. But I heard nothing in return. I was trapped and these long pointy metal rods began jabbing me from all angles. I was bleeding profusely and I screamed. It felt so real and it hurt so badly. I actually felt like my skin was being torn open. I've never had a dream so vivid, and to this day, I've never had one like that. Eventually, I woke up in my bed, my body sore all over. I remembered my horrible nightmare and checked all over my body. The weird part, though, was I went to bed wearing clothes. I always do. But when I woke up, my clothes were in the floor. I tried to ignore it. I figured I took them off in my sleep and I kept checking. There were no marks, no scratches, no blood on my body. I felt reassured. I thought I was just being silly. After all, it was just a dream. I was probably just sore from thrashing in bed during a nightmare. I went about my day and that evening went to a local hangout stop I frequented. I started talking to some friends there when one of the guys began to tell us about a crazy dream he had that night. And the dream was the exact same one I had. The window, the cages, the figures, the torture. It was all 100% the same. I was feeling a bit freaked out after this. I asked him if we could talk in private. I explained my dream to him, how it was identical, and he looked scared too at the time. After that, we started to research online about similar nightmares. Everything that came up was about alien abduction. I don't know if I got abducted, and I don't know what really happened, 
but two people sharing the exact same dream experience, the figures, the pain. All I do know is I did not sleep well for a long time after that. Number four, realignment, submitted by Glitchin' Out. The story is a bit of a long one, and it does require some background information. I currently am a 21-year-old male. At the time, I was a freshman in high school. I am a pretty big guy and always have been. I'm currently six foot four and was six foot three in freshman year. I'm not muscular, but have a muscular build and broad shoulders. I've always had some weird connections with the paranormal and I live in a very religious family. For example, when I was four, my mom remembers putting me down for a nap, only to find out that I did not sleep at all. But she said I told her I spent that nap meeting my guardian angel and playing with him. I even told her his name, Michael. Many people in my family report seeing angels and beings throughout our lives. As a freshman in high school, I spent a lot of time hanging out with my very religious friend, Nate. I personally was not very faithful in the Christian belief of God at the time. This was a time in my life when I was very confused with how the world worked and did not believe faith was necessary, and I still don't. This is mildly important as it relates. The first night was an absolutely normal night as I was at my best friend Nate's house. We decided to invite some girls over to hang out but as teens living in a small town in Wisconsin, we really didn't like to go out unless the adventure had already been pre-planned. So that night, we decided to sit on Nate's computer and go through our MySpaces and browse YouTube. The girls seemed a little off, like something was bothering them. While browsing YouTube, I noticed a cool looking UFO sighting. Mind you, I was obsessed with aliens. I clicked on it. And when I did, the two girls freaked out. They then went on to explain that two nights prior to this, they were hanging out with another girl who had told them that she had been abducted. She even had strange markings to prove it. The girl said that after hearing this and seeing this, they were mildly on edge, but later that night, they both fell asleep. They said that when they woke up, they had random scars on their chest and back, and they said they felt ridiculously tired as they woke, like they hadn't slept all night. They were simply freaked out and spouted to me these events after clicking the video and begged me to turn it off. We continued our night without any crazy stuff happening. I did joke around with them, telling them that Nate and I were next. Nate being religious was calling BS on the story the whole time and trying to rationalize it into religion. And that pretty much drove them home, which I was okay with because it was getting pretty late. The next day I went home to shower and change and then headed right back to Nathan's house. We hung out pretty much every day. Nothing crazy happened that day save for some goofy shenanigans and video games. Later that night though, Nate was on MySpace. His computer is set in the dining room in the corner furthest from the living room. The living room was separated by a wall with a double door hallway without the door but with the curtain separating them. The living room is set up with both couches against both walls and the TV opposite those couches in another corner. From the living room, you could see the stairs going up to the second story. I sat on the small couch with full visibility of the stairs, but no visibility of Nate due to the curtain that was drawn. I knew he was on MySpace because I could hear the constant chatter of keyboard keys and quiet music. He had it turned down because his family was sleeping. He was listening to Monster by Skillet. I was on the couch watching Adult Swim on Cartoon Network, and it was about 10, 10 p.m. At the time, Robot Chicken was my favorite show, and I was enjoying it when out of nowhere, I noticed a light shining through the window at the top of the stairs, shining down the stairs as if someone flipped on the lights. In my mind, I thought it was his mom or dad, so I switched the channel so I wouldn't get in trouble for watching Adult Swim. Again, they're very Christian. Then I noticed the light continuing to shine down the stairs, also began to shine through the front door and the bay window, looking into the three-season room. The light was enveloping the whole of the outside of the house. This all happened in a matter of a few seconds. The next thing I knew, the light had shined through all those windows and then from the window behind me. I began to panic. In my head, either a nuke had gone off or there were cars surrounding the whole of the house. This light then made a pulsing vibration, like a plane flying but closer to your ears and more calming like a heartbeat. As the light grew in vibrancy and blocked out all the other visual things, I could no longer see anything except white. In this moment, I turned my head towards where Nate was and regardless of the wall dividing us, I somehow saw him and he saw me. He was floating as if he was sitting in an invisible chair. It was as if the walls had been removed and he was looking at me in a state of panic. All I could say was, what the hell? It came out in a quiet voice as if I was whispering, but inside my head, I was screaming. 
As soon as my sentence was finished, the whiteness blinked away, and I was still sitting on the couch watching the same TV, and Nate was still at the computer. Almost immediately, Nate and I both jumped up from our seats and started to freak out about what just happened. Nathan said he heard me say what the hell and saw me floating as well, but he said my mouth didn't move when we talked. He sweared up and down that it had something to do with God, but I resorted to aliens after hearing about those girls' story. While freaking out, we woke up his dad by accident. Eventually, he went back to sleep after hearing our ridiculous testimony. Then the two of us sat in the living room in silence. It took a moment for us to realize that we were watching an infomercial on Cartoon Network. It was now 3.30 in the morning. I jumped up and screamed at Nate. We had been gone for five hours. In those 10 seconds, we were away from reality for five hours. I've told many people of this story and I'll be telling it for the rest of my life. Whether it was a glitch, abduction, or some sort of religious experience, I don't know. It was amazing, terrifying, and profound. I will never forget the vibration inside of this light. Unlike the girls, though, I did not get any particular markings on my body. Today, I am agnostic. I've tried smoking marijuana to try to feel that glitch feeling again, which I've had at work before, but I've only seen that bright light one other time since then but that time I got to see the source of it, and it was not earthly. Mind you, being a freshman in high school, I didn't do drugs or have any mental issues. Long story short, I'm still very close with Nate, and we tell everyone close to us these stories separately to try to prove that our experience really happened. But to us, we never really figured out what happened to us that night. Number five, Summer Alien Abduction. Submitted by Siki McNeil. I am 20 years old today, and this encounter happened seven years ago. I grew up with a huge family of seven brothers and five sisters. A good chunk of us still lived at home. I lived in Canada, British Columbia, on a reserve that is a piece of land that First Nations live on. My family is very aware of the paranormal and believes in all spirits and creatures that wander the world. It was normal for us to sneak out at night and search for creatures that my dad would tell us. Our favorite pastime when we were younger was looking for aliens and discussing about what if we get abducted one day. It was the summer of 2009. I was 13 years old, and my favorite pastime was staying up late watching TV and drawing. My bedroom's quite small and is on the second floor. I had enough room for a queen-size bed in the middle of the room against the back wall with the closet in front of me and my TV stand and a window to the right of me. This night was a little different, and around 2.30 or 3 in the morning, most everyone in the house was asleep. I have to say, being a teenager and it being summer, I would stay up super late and sleep until 5 in the afternoon, so I wasn't ready to go to bed at this time. I was watching TV, and from the corner of my eye, I see a flashing color of lights, and I didn't think too much of it, because our neighbors are the partying type. Then my TV begins to go to static, cutting out of the TV show I was watching, and eventually it goes out and my room is completely dark. I think nothing more than that being weird, and I assume at most it's one of the spirits bugging me like they usually do. The light of the moon lit up my room still, and I could barely make out two purple grayish humanoid figures beside me. They weren't tall, they stood about five feet tall and were very skinny. Their hands were weird looking. I stared at them for a while, rubbing my eyes to see if I was imagining things, but I wasn't. Immediately, I was scared and I ran under my blankets, but as soon as I did, my whole sight went black. Then a flurry of visions ran through my head. They were flashbacks from the time I was born to the very last minute when I was watching TV. Normally, when I realize I'm having a dream of sorts, I can wake myself up, but I couldn't move, I was stuck. When I woke up, it was morning and the feeling of waking up felt weird. There was a fuzziness around me and it seemed like I was walking on air. I was both scared and shocked. I jumped out of my bed and ran to the kitchen to find my sister and brother talking to my mom and dad. They were talking about how they were seeing stuff around my house. Last night, they described seeing two beings that were short and skinny with big heads. They said they were too scared to move from their beds when they saw them. I was so shocked because I wasn't the only one who saw these things last night. I told my parents about my experience and I was happy that they believed me and that I was not crazy. My brother jokingly said, I guess you were too weird and useless. They didn't want you, so they sent you back. I laughed nervously and I agreed with him. 
I find the experience weird and shocking to this day, and I still wonder about it. Why did they abduct me? Occasionally, I bring it up to my parents. We still live on the reserve in the same house. I mean, I don't live there anymore. I've moved out. But whenever I go back, my room is still my room, and sometimes I find myself staring out the window at the sky. Number six, Airsoft Alien, submitted by Artorius A. My story begins just two years ago when I was 16 and getting into airsoft. My friend who we'll call Jay introduced me to the sport and even bought me my first gun. It was a pretty fun time. I met Jay when I was in high school until he moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Luckily for me, he's only a few hours drive, so it's not that much of a pain. To give you an idea of how we played airsoft, we used to play in the woods 10 minutes away from my home. We'd go deep into the woods, and once we found an area we liked, we'd go at it. On this particular day, we decided to play at night to give us this tactical espionage action feel to the game. He's more of a CQB kind of guy, and his loadout was not doing so well out there. We were 30 minutes into the game when Jay and I felt this throbbing in our heads with a weird type of sound. I did my best to call out to Jay, but I got no response. Hoping to make this throbbing stop, I put in my headphones. I was theorizing that it was a sound, and lo and behold, I was half right. The throbbing partially decreased to a bearable state, and I started running towards the direction to where I was. But when I got there, what I witnessed both horrified and awed me. There was a tall being, probably seven feet tall or so. It was holding Jay with both of her hands. I say her because she was blonde, very pale, and had the curvatures of a female. She was so beautiful, but oddly not human at all. Her eyes were way too narrow, but big. It sounds weird, I just don't know how to describe it. She wore this kind of vault tech suit, but it was metallic, like wearable metallic. It's hard to explain, but it was two different shades of gray, and it was skin tight from what it seems. She turned to me and said, everything will be all right. I don't know how she said it, because her mouth didn't move. I don't want to say it was telepathy, but I don't know what else it could have been. I was scared out of my mind because this person, this thing, was taking Jay away, and I had to do something. My first instinct was to shoot at her, but I caught myself before I pulled the trigger because pellets wouldn't do a damn thing against this woman. So I yelled out, wait, and she looked at me like the way a mother would when she's curious as to what her little kid just said. I told her with a shakiness in my voice, Jay needs to stay here. You can't take my friend. He has a family to go home to, a girlfriend who will honestly blame me for his disappearance. All the responsibility will be on me. She smiled warmly and placed Jay back down. She then said to me, One day, I'll be here for you. Do not worry, as you will come back. Then a blinding light shone behind her, and she stepped into it. The light proceeded to fly up, and what I can only assume was a UFO flew up into the sky and vanished. A little while later, Jay wakes up and tells me he passed out from the throbbing in his head. I was glad to have my friend back, but I was also scared and horrified that I'm the only one who knows what happened that day. I haven't told anyone because this obviously sounds like crazy as all hell made up stuff. I've had a lot of crazy things happen while airsofting, and that's number two on the list. I'm sorry if this seems all over the place. The events of that night still haunt me to this day, and I haven't seen the woman since. I'd be lying to say if I said I wasn't scared, because I am. If anyone out there has had an experience like that, please share it with us. I just want to know I'm not going crazy. Number seven, Mom's Abduction, submitted by Amy. This is not my story, but my mother's. Growing up, she often spoke of aliens. She was a believer, and I was as well. As I became a teenager, my mom and I were very close, best friends, if you will. We told each other everything. We were talking about aliens, and I asked her if she knew anyone who had ever been abducted. She said to me that she had. She said she doesn't really remember it, but she knows it happened when she was four. She said she remembers just bits and pieces. I freaked out a little, and she ended the conversation because she did not want to scare me. A few years later, my mom became very sick, she began passing out, having tunnel vision, and had lots of head pain. She went to doctor after doctor until finally she discovered she had a disorder called Arnold Chiari malformation. 
Basically, a piece of her brain had fallen into her neck and was crushing her spinal column. They took an MRI, scheduled her brain surgery, and scheduled another MRI right before her surgery. About a week before her surgery, after she woke up, this particular morning, she found me in the living room. Her eyes were wide and her skin was pale. I wouldn't say she was frightened, but she looked shocked. She told me that aliens came to visit her last night. I was a little freaked out, but intrigued, so I asked what happened. She said she woke up in the middle of the night, set up in bed to see three gray aliens at the foot of her bed. She said she was not afraid, but she kept trying to wake my dad up by pinching him, and he wouldn't wake up, like he was in a trance or something. The gray in the middle did all of the talking, but their mouths never moved, so they must have been talking through their thoughts. He told her that when she was a little girl, they had implanted a device in her head to monitor her. They were done, so they needed to get it out. She said the one on the right was nice, but didn't say a lot, but the one on the left was very angry. It was as if he did not want to be there, like she was a waste of his time. She asked the one in the middle if it would hurt. He told her no, but she will have a headache when she wakes up. She asked if it was all real, and he told her, you can pretend this is a dream and go back to bed, but if you want proof, it's real. Look out your window and you'll see a blue light in the sky. He then instructed her to lie back. He placed his hand on her forehead. She felt a sudden shooting pain in her head, like a bad headache. She opened her eyes and they were gone. She got out of bed and was hoping to see a blue dot in the sky. It wasn't just a blue dot. There was a huge blue light hovering over our back pasture for about 10 seconds before it shot off. She took some medicine and went back to bed. Then she woke up shocked and told me this story. I believed my mom's every word. I could see it in her eyes. A few days later, I rode to the city with her for her last MRI. She was blindsided after the MRI when the doctor asked her what had happened. She asked, what do you mean? The doctor asked her if she had any trauma to her head. My mom told her no, and then she asked why. She said, because there's a hole in your brain. She pointed to the hole in the MRI. Then she shows us the results from the first MRI, and the hole was not there. I looked at my mom and she looked at me. She had a fear I can't explain in her eyes. It freaked her out. She whispered nervously to me. I told you so. She has her surgery and the surgeon said there was a substance on the hole in her brain that he could not explain. He said he got a sample of it and would let us know. But we never heard back from him. We never heard what it was. When we had asked about it weeks later, all he would say is, I don't know what you're talking about. But I think he does know and he doesn't want to say. Number eight, the alien in the hallway. Submitted by Jennifer W. This story happened when I was a child. I had always remembered waking up and seeing things that horrified me in the middle of the night. One night, when I was about nine years old, I woke up at what I would guess was around two in the morning. I looked in the hallway and I saw it. I must admit that as a young child, I was always haunted by terrifying creatures I couldn't explain. But when I looked into the hallway, it was just standing there. I saw it from a profile standpoint, so I only saw it from the side. It was green and probably four feet tall. It had two fingers in each hand, and it had a green glow around it. There were scales on its head, and it was very skinny. I was sleeping in my parents' bedroom that night because I felt like I was going to see something that night. Sometimes I could feel when they were going to come, no matter what they were. I could see the thing from my parents' room standing in the hallway, looking into my room. It was putting one of its hands into its mouth as if it was concerned that I was not in my room. I stared at it with horror. I was thinking, not even my parents can protect me from this thing. It never turned to look at me. Though I was petrified, I somehow fell back asleep and in the morning it was gone. I never saw it again after that. However, I believe that it has come more than once. I believe it came several times. I had no proof of it, but I believe it returned. I could feel it, but I never saw it. Number nine, seeing an alien. Submitted by Crystal Star Knight. This happened to me just a few months ago. Originally, I shared it on Reddit after it happened. At the time, I was living with a good friend of mine who lives in the middle of nowhere out in the woods. Everyone in her family are pretty hardcore skeptics, including me, which is probably why we are such good friends. 
What I mean by hardcore skeptic is that we are those kinds of people that tend to try hard to poke holes in the stories of everything we hear or read. We tend to rely more on facts than personal testimony, so we don't really believe in ghosts, cryptids, or aliens. Now to get to the story. At the time I was living in this house, my cat would sleep in the room with me and would wake up at around five in the morning every night to go use the litter box which we kept downstairs. This particular morning though, my cat woke me up by meowing in my face and jumping all over me. When I looked at the clock, it was only a little after two in the morning. I just thought my cat needed to go to use the litter box early and I needed to pee anyway. So I let my cat out and ran down the hall to the right downstairs where his box was. Now the main restroom was straight across from my room and I went in without turning on any lights because my eyes were already pretty adjusted to the dark. In this bathroom, there is one window you can look out of when you sit down on the toilet and we always kept it open because the air in the house was broken and it could get really hot in there. This was about the middle of the summer, so the whole house was pretty warm. My roommate's dogs were barking outside when I sat down, but they bark at squirrels all the time, so there was nothing to be afraid of. I look out the window to the backyard where they are kept and notice that they were running around the shed where we all play D&D. The main shed door was open and I thought that was odd because we always kept it closed so the dogs would not go in and mess anything up because we left our boards and stuff out when we weren't playing. After peeing, I stood up and I flushed the toilet, but then I looked out into the shed and I could see a light coming from it. It wasn't a normal light. This was much brighter and in front of the door, I could see a shadowy figure. It was a typical alien body, I guess. Big head, small body, and really long arms and legs that seemed disproportionate to the body. Suddenly, the light went out and everything was just super dark dark like when you turn off your bedroom light and your eyes are nowhere near adjusted to the dark. The dogs were also quiet and I could hear the wind blowing lightly through the leaves of the trees in the backyard. I guess I had a late adrenaline reaction though because I ran out of the restroom and down the hallway to get to my friend's husband and tell him something was in the shed. He jumped out of bed and got his gun and he ran down the hall towards the kitchen to look out into the shed. And in the meantime, I told my friend what had happened and she seemed really concerned for me in my mental state. Her husband came back after a few minutes and asked me to go out to the shed with them to explain exactly what I saw. We went out to the shed with me telling them both everything. Nothing was out of place though. Everything was set up exactly like it was from the last time we had been in there. My roommate and her husband both laughed at me and told me that the whole thing must have just been a nightmare, that maybe I had slept walk to the toilet or something. So that whole experience must have happened between five to 10 minutes tops. I mean, it doesn't even take five minutes to go to the bathroom, right? Well, when I went back to my room, two and a half hours had passed. It was now 4.30. We never talked about it again, and I never saw anything like that again. I still don't know if I believe in aliens or anything like that, but I have no idea what happened that night. I just can't explain what I saw. But I do know for sure it was 2 a.m. when I went to the bathroom, and it was 4.30 when I got back. I cannot explain that much time distortion and there's nothing I can do to reason that to myself. And number 10, Atlanta Alien Encounter, submitted by Big Bad Dog 101. I had an unexplained incident a couple of years ago, but the problem with trying to relate it to aliens is that I was living in a hotel in downtown Atlanta. So one night when I was sleeping, I suddenly found myself wide awake, but I could not open my eyes. I could sense another person in my room. I just couldn't move like I had been paralyzed. I bit the inside of my lip hard enough to draw blood and I was suddenly able to move again. I grabbed my knife that I keep under my pillow. I lived in a bad neighborhood. I opened my eyes and I lunged at a human shaped figure standing in the middle of my room. And the moment I touched it, it just vanished and then it reappeared behind me while I was on the floor trying to get up. I have no words to describe what I saw, but there was an unusually bright light coming through my window and the figure was clearly not human. It disappeared and the bright light faded away. I attributed the whole incident as me still dreaming while being awake because I guess that makes the most sense to me 